Coming to you direct from the nerve center of the galaxy's greatest comic. This is the 2000 AD Thrill Cars. Borag Thunder Athletes and welcome to the 2000 AD Thrillcast. I am your host, as always, Molchar. A bit of a scene change if you're watching this on YouTube, um, having to move around the house because of building work, which is great. So there might be a little bit of background noise uh, during the course of this episode, for which I apologise. Um, thank you to everyone who's uh, fed back on the most recent uh, episodes of the podcast. It is massively appreciated. If there is a theme or a guest or just something you'd like us to talk about, then do drop us a line at thrillcast at 2000ad.com. Thrillcast, all one word, at 2000ad.com. So uh, before we uh, crack on with this week's guests, I'm going to talk about uh, stuff that's coming up this month. Now that we uh, we are into May, uh, we've got three esteemable publications uh, coming out. First off is uh, Smash, the Smash special. Now, I've talked about this a little bit before on the podcast. Uh, we're hopefully going to be have uh, having some of the creators from the Smash uh, special on the podcast over the coming weeks. It's uh, a lot of fun. Some really great characters from the archive. Steel Claw, Might It the Mighty, Johnny Future. I, I just, yeah, uh, absolutely fantastic to see that come together. So that's out at the end of May. We've also got the Judge Dread Case Files number 35. Now, bit of an issue with this one, obviously because of the lockdown. This is going to be digital first, so it's going to come out uh, as a, a, a digital collection. Uh, and uh, the physical collection will come out later this year. But uh, if you are willing to pick it up in uh, in digital, then please do, because it is well worth your time. An absolute cracking collection. Uh, we focused on it a few episodes ago with my colleague Owen Johnson. And uh, yeah, you've got Sin City in there, which if that's not a more, a more apposite uh series to read at the moment i don't know what is um we've also got judge Dread magazine 420 which is out in the middle of this month uh do support the magazine uh it is uh i, I, I speak not as uh, somebody who works at 2080 but as a, a reader of the magazine for many 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 years uh it's been playing an absolute blinder over the last few years you know not just a series like lawless um but uh the the dread has been consistently high quality and we've got uh judge Dread artist PJ Holden on the episode. Uh, he's got stuff running in the Meg and the Prog at the same time. Bit of a dream come true for him. So, um, without much further ado, we're going to have a chat with PJ. I've heard lots of good feedback uh, and reaction to the uh, Noam Chink Chimpsky story, which has been running, written by Kenneth Nyman uh, in the Prog. And uh, uh, it was a pleasure to be able to chat to PJ, who's uh, someone who's always good value. Uh, about uh, his current work and his career and uh, yeah uh, drawing comics I guess uh, and yeah let's just crack on <laughs> running out of words let's talk about uh, Chimpsky because okay. uh, it's it's, a, it's the strip that you've got running at the moment um, mm -hmm. uh, it's it's a remarkably popular character yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm slightly baffled. Not having ever done a remarkably popular or even a minorly popular character, that's slightly baffling. I mean, it's very much up my street. It's very, <laughs> and, and, and very much the, seems to be the writer's speed as well. They seem to be things that... So I think, um, I think if, if we're lucky that people like it. And I don't know whether it's because... I mean, the first one went over really well. And... and um, like the people seem to like the artwork and seem to like the character, but it was never, I mean, it was like such a small taste of what that character could be. Um, I was slightly surprised that people liked it so much. I mean, great, brilliant, you know, but I, it's always, it's one of those things where you, you kind of, I don't think you can necessarily set out to create a character people will like. It's very hard. I mean, how do you do that? I don't know. Um, and so I'm, I'm grateful that they like it. I, I mean, I, I love I love Chimsky. I love uh, Chimsky's world. He's so much fun to draw because you, you've got, I mean, you are kind of literally just goofing around with the, with this character. And, and I'm always trying to do a, um, a counterpoint to the, to the monologue. He's, you know, there's schemes going on. He's very, very clever and he knows what he's doing. But at the same time, everyone looks at a and sees a stupid chimp. So you're constantly kind of drawing a kind of goofy, 
you know, which I, you've known me a long time, Mike. If that doesn't sound like me, I don't know. <laughs> I feel there's a lot of PJ in Shimsky. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Very much, yeah. Uh, and yeah, Kenneth Ni- Nyman. Is it Nyman or Nyman? I'm always saying that wrong. I, I've always said Nyman. Okay, well, let's go. Let's say it's Nyman then. Um, writes a really good script, so you know I'm very, very happy. It's, it's, uh, and we're doing. I mean, I don't know if I can say. Should I say we're doing more? I think there's more Chimsky. There's, there's more Chimsky on the way. So when this is done, there's more Chimsky on on the way. Um, and I'm really enjoying doing this one as well. Um, and it's tinged a little bit with the current sort of social isolation stuff. It's kind of funny that that first Chimsky cover somebody pointed out at the. That, oh, it's very, you know, it's very nigh because it's, it's one person on their own, socially isolated with wearing a face mask. And it's like, oh, well, that wasn't my intent. <laughs> and on top of a 5G tower. On top of a yeah. I mean, wow, I hit all the checkpoints there, didn't I? Um, <laughs> Are you a witch? <laughs> I mean, I, don't, I've got my, I worry someone's going to look at that and go, wait a minute, wait a minute, have they something to do with it? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you do sometimes, I think you just, if you do enough work, eventually you'll stumble across the zeitgeist, whether you mean to or not, I think. It just seems to be the way. So, yeah, I mean, I'm quite, I'm quite pleased with it. And it's very, um, I, th- I think I said to Rob Williams, it's like, if I can't draw the hell out of Chimsky, there, what can I draw? I mean, <laughs> if I can't draw that strip to look good, <laughs> I mean, give, give it all up. I can't do anything, you know, because uh, it is very what I like. Somebody drew my attention to um, uh, a comment they saw online, which was that we, we have a, 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 an opportunity at the moment to compare you on two strips at the yeah, same time yeah. because you, you, you've got the strip running in the magazine as well. Right. Do you remember? Do you remember? But I mean, you and I have known each other a long time, right? So I knew, I've known you from before you were working for 2008. I suspect before I was working for 2008. Yeah, yeah, it's a very long time ago. Yeah, so so I mean, at some point, the idea that I would be running the dreads, I would be drawing dread in the magazine and 2008. How absurd! I mean, <laughs> it's just. I mean, as as it happens, it's just an accident of scheduling. You know, there's no big grand plan or anything. I think Matt had said to me um, on both jobs, it was kind of yeah, here's here's a gig. Uh, just whenever there's no deadline just whenever so so they kind of they were uh, done while i was doing um the uh, war book i've been doing with garth ennis and and so they were kind of they came towards the tail end of that and there was no big deadline so there's no big rush so i just did those and then coincidentally they're coming not only are they coming out at the same time so is the flipping war book it's coming out at the end of this month as well it's like everything i've drawn is just like I've spent a year vanished. I didn't exist because I was drawing all of these things, and now they're all coming out in the same bloody month. It's really annoying, but <laughs> but it is kind of cool. It is kind of cool. But I I definitely I mean the 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 strip I did with Arthur uh, Wyatt, which is um, Bad Sector, I wanted a kind of noir body horror style, which is what I was going for and i uh, i mean it, it's one of those you always take a slight gamble when you're doing i i used a lot of gray toning technique stuff in it and you take a bit of a gamble because you don't quite know how it's going to print and it i think the gray toning gets a little bit lost in in the printing process so you know lessons learned from that but yeah i mean it was it's definitely me leaning on on a more kind of gothic horror than it is goofy silliness you know so i so i mean it's interesting to me I, I think the reaction seems to be oh this is very the goofy stuff is clearly my meter it's clearly where i sit um but you know i enjoy you know, i don't think the other strips drawn badly i don't think it's drawn quite well i think i don't know i don't know Wait, i mean let, let, let's talk about your style because uh you know like you said we've known each other for a long time and mm. and there is that recognizable pj holden style mm. but you've had you can't escape yourself. You can't escape yourself, Mike. You try, try every day is a is a battle to get away from myself, and every day I feel and fall flat in my face and go, nope, couldn't escape that time either. Well, it, like you, you've had some ups and downs with with with, with that style, as, as like I say, you've tried to run away from it and yeah. and uh, try to adapt it and reclaim it. Um, what are your feelings about it now? I yeah, well, I definitely. I think I can't remember who said it, but I remember somebody saying um, your style is basically all the mistakes you make. You know, it, it just it is what it is. There's no and I, and I was like in the early days of the my career, I was definitely 
prone to kind of going, well, I've got a, I mean, and I actually, it's one of the things I love about 2000 AD is you'll get a four page future shock and you'll go, well, why do I have to draw it the way I've drawn every other thing I've ever drawn? Why can't I draw it radically different and see, and maybe I'll make a mistake and it'll be, it'll be good. But my philosophy has always been one. It's four pages in a weekly comic. You know, it's not going to, none of the, very few of these things move the needle in any massive way. So there's an opportunity to kind of try something different. And that, that's the stuff I always loved seeing stuff in 2080 that is radically different. I even like seeing stuff I don't like, you know, cause that, that suggests to me that um, there it's reaching a, a readership that not, I, I'm not part of, you know, it's reaching other people that I don't, uh, that I'm not, I, they're getting something different from it than I would be, which is not a bad thing. I think it's a healthy thing. An anthology title should have something in it you don't like. I think that's that's the norm, um, because there will be so many other things you do like, and then it'll the, the natural turn of it will mean eventually there'll be a load of stuff you do like and so on. Um, so I think I was I was trying to find my feet. Certainly on on dread, like every dread strip I drew for the first few years, I was. Uh, tweaking the uniform tweaking how i drew dread kind of figuring out well should the helmet look like that or this and i mean i'm i i think there are some guys that came out of the, like jock came out of the gate with a perfect dread it's like wow his dread is whoa it's like he's drawn that for a thousand years and he knows exactly what he's doing and and um mike mcmahon drew dread brilliantly in every single permutation of his style it looked great uh but for me it was like mm, I haven't got my dread yet and it took I, th I mean I think I've got my dread now and I like how I draw a dread now I don't know how others feel but I like like when I draw a dread I think yeah that's a pretty good dread I like that dread um but that's taken years of shaving things away and you know chopping it and losing this bit and adding this bit and kind of to get to the point now I've got dread the way exactly the way I would want to draw them I think now I've got to work on all the other things <laughs> <laughs> everything else so yeah i mean i don't get to experiment as much as i like part of that as well i think is is um having done a bunch of american books where the expectation is we need six issues there's 22 pages each and they better not vary very much between issue one to issue you know issue six they had better have exactly the same style all the way through so there's less scope for playing um but then 2080 i mean and i say you can definitely see it in the in the magazine dread and the and the two thousand e d dread where i the, the nature of the story is different anyway, so you don't want exactly the same art style i don't think i don't think a realistic chimsky would play as well as a kind of playful uh kind of cartoonish character um so i think you, you there is scope to do it and i do i mean i think I, I am, there's things I'm good at and things I'm not good at. I think one of the things I'm good at is I've got range. You know, I can draw badly in a whole bunch of different ways. My, my, <laughs> my lack of skill knows no bounds. <laughs> so, so, I mean, I think, I think it's not so much that, I think uh, over time, of course, you find your own voice, but also over time, the opportunity to play with different styles hasn't been there because I've been doing big American books and say the graphic novel with Garth is 176 pages. That's like a year of drawn and you can't, I mean, you've got to be consistent with that. You can't go too far. That said, I think when it comes to people's expressions and faces, I always lean slightly cartoonier because it, it, you, it's, it's the great, um, I think it's Chuck Jones quote, which is when Bugs Bunny gets hit by a hammer it, you don't draw it how it looks, you draw it how it feels. And that's kind of, I, I, want, I want to draw faces how it feels. I want to draw people. So when you look at their face and you see their smile and, you know, they're slyly smiling about something, you don't want to read it and go, oh, they're slyly smiling. You want to feel it. You want to feel that that's the emotion that they're carrying. You want to feel part of that. And I think that's, I, I hope that's what I can do. I, I mean, and I, there's definitely a, a section of readers, I think, that just, bulk at any cartoony caricature -y type stuff and I, I'm maybe not their artist you know I, and that's a shame but I, I think that's a philosophical difference that that we'll never be able to square off but then there are other people I think that really really like it so I don't know I'm just grateful Matt lets me play. I'm, I'm, I'm always interested in, in um, a reaction like that, that that you talk about where, where you know people don't like uh, cartoony stuff or want the better mm. phrase um then they're, they're much more you 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 and and yeah, Davis yeah. and people like that um because uh i would place your stuff much more in the vein of mick mcmahon you know mm. that that kind of i'll take that exaggerated. 
in the vein. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. Bugger. <laughs> um, We've wait, had a rich it, it, seam of Mick McMahon here, but well, there's some PJ in it as well. I, I mean, we'll just leave it there. We'll move on. Fool's gold. It's fool's yes. gold, mate. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it's all about exaggeration and, and, mm. and for me it, quite often that that fits much better when you're dealing with citizen stories which mm. you know um i love you, citizen you, stories i love them i love crazy citizens i love um i love getting to play in that world where you know there's goofy bad you know there's there's idiots trying to attempt a terrorist coup which is what's happening in in chimsky and and that kind of big wide expansive world i mean it's one of the things i think that we've lost a little bit over the years is how goofy Dread's world actually was to begin with. I mean, we haven't seen a kind of story with characters with giant noses, you know, whereas, you know, it's, it's, I, I mean, I'm, and I'm guilty of it as well, where I'm drawn, um, drawn Dread's world and I forget there are aliens in it. I forget that this is a world that has robots and aliens and citizens that alter their faces to have no expressions on their faces. I forget all of that stuff because I'm drawn, I don't know, like a, a crime scene or something. And so I, I think, I, I mean, I'm always actively trying to bring, you know, there, there are decisions, the danger is always, I think for me, and I think for most artists, that when you're drawn dreads where you kind of homogenize everything because you forget you you just you get into a comfortable groove and start drawing people uh and then and then, so you have to make a very active decision to go well why am i drawing everyone to look exactly alike i should start this is a bigger this is this should be london in the underground it shouldn't be my local shop it should be you know a bigger goofier stranger world um and and i do i mean i particularly love funny citizen stories and it and it affords me the opportunity to draw big goofy characters and i i, I mean i never do that with dread dread is never cartoony in, in any of the strips i draw he's always very uh real he's concrete and you know chiseled out of granite and i think that's maybe why i get away with it a little bit because i don't i don't ever caricature dread so much but but i'd certainly caricature everyone else i do think as well there's there's um sometimes i think and it might be a mistake on my part but but i i will you know if the script calls for a character to be of a certain type and i think the readers are expecting it to be realistic and so i think cartooning can be very obvious where you draw a goofy character and it'll be like ah all right as you can see why in university people call me face ah um <laughs> for the audio listeners making a i was making a goofy face um so that's just your face mate that's just my face permanently so uh there is that kind of edge of cartooning where people go that's a cartoony character but there's also the cartooniness where you go uh, in in the strip at the moment there's a judge stands who's a kind of you know he's a judge that shouldn't be on the street he should very clearly be not on the street now if i were to draw that realistically he would be slightly pudgy he would be you know there wouldn't you would look at him and you go well he looks like another judge i don't see any problem with that character at all whereas instead what i've had to do is exaggerate those characters Characteristics because you want to you want the reader to look at it and go god jesus that guy shouldn't be a judge that's the reaction you want you want to provoke a very instant uh, visceral reaction to go why is that guy a judge um whereas if you'd gone sort of more realistic and gone well you know he would have failed all of these various tests but he looks real you know it would be it would still it would be a cerebral exercise and oh yes i'll read all of this yes i think dread's right that guy should not be a judge probably on balance of and it's like no 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 i want i want you to understand from the artwork from new dial i mean when i started um drawing comics well sorry not when i started drawing comics but when my wife and i got together it was in 1995 and i was just kind of learning how to do the the uh you know my first comic stuff get my first comic stuff done i would show work to my wife um and say can you understand what's happening here there was no dialogue on it and she's not a comic reader and i go can you understand what's happening and she would go is this and then this and is that person are they stupid or and if she didn't understand it from the artwork alone i was not doing my job right you know i i, I would need to go away and 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 that i think pushed me slightly towards caricature because i think you know the caricature is instantly readable you understand what you're looking at when when you see it you understand that uh, you know it's you know there's there's um there's a, a a fat character there's a thin character there's you know there's the haughty character there's the goofy character you see all of that straight away with a good but it just sometimes just a subtle amount but but you can see all of that and that's 
uh, that's what I'm always trying to do. I'm trying to make it very instantly readable, you know, so you can, you can, you can get that from just looking at the page. I think, I hope that's where I'm aiming for anyway. So one, one thing that uh, we've kind of touched on this one already, but uh, one thing that has always struck me about your work is, is how there are always, you can clearly see different elements com competing with each other, jostling for, um, <laughs> for, for dominance in a, in, mm. in a way. It and doesn't sound like my thinking, does it? My, my, <laughs> it doesn't sound like the inner workings of my brain at, at all, does it? No. And, and it was interesting that, um, I, I can't remember what we posted on Twitter um, a few weeks ago, and, and you said, uh, I need to stop looking at this because... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I can't remember what it was. Oh, it, yeah, was, it yeah. was that... Um, oh, it, um, it was that comic that I picked up that I read when I was younger, the um, the Space Force. Uh, do, you, uh, do you remember? It was it was that um, late seventies comic, and I posted the thing up on Instagram, and it was really richly coloured. Oh right, I can't remember. I can't remember. Uh, but I'm I'm pretty sure you're right. Away. I'm pretty sure that whatever it was, I looked at it, and for about twenty minutes, everything I drew looked at like like that because I couldn't <laughs> shake it out of my head. Because I am like you know I'm I'm not very bright. I just you know monkey see monkey do, which is why I'm so good at Chimsky. <laughs> <laughs> just i see a thing and i go ah oh, let me do that for 20 minutes i've got become obsessed with dread cutouts so you've seen it on twitter i'm sure i've become slightly i think i don't know if it's just because i've been sitting in the house and that on my own and thinking oh do you know i'd like to do a dread standee like and i could do a dread and a, a, a judge anderson and judge hershey and 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 obsessively thinking about these things and do, drawing them and going i could do more of this i could do more of this and trying to and then going why am I doing this? <laughs> no one's paying me for this. I'm just, I've been stupid. I should be working on something else. Leave this alone. But I can't, I can't, I end up kind of obsessing about things and, and sort of getting them stuck in. And there is a day, like I, I remember, oh, I can't remember, it might have been 10 years ago or something. I saw a guy who'd drawn these noses and it was a very particular way of drawing noses. I went, oh, that's really great. I'll, I think I'll steal some of that. Just I'll steal a little bit of that. So I stole a little bit. I, for about, Two years, I couldn't shake those noses. I couldn't get rid of them out of my artwork. I couldn't draw normal. I couldn't draw any other kind of nose apart from those noses. It just would not go. So, and I've got to be careful about the stuff I bring in, <laughs> just in case I can't get rid of it again. So, uh, anyway, um, with the dread stuff that you've done, you, you, you've 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 done short stories. You've done mm. uh, longer ones. I think you, you did a big um, uh, post dead chaos uh, storyline. Um, has there ever been a moment when, you, when you've looked at what you've been doing and thought, yeah, I, that, that, that's, that's spot on? Or is, or is I'm, I'm, I'm getting a sense that you're never quite happy with what you've done? I'm never, ever happy. I, I definitely, I'm happy when I'm, it's one of those things, you know, all artists uh, like drawing, but hate, I, I, all artists like having drawn, but nobody likes drawing. I quite like drawing, but I hate having drawn. It's, it's afterwards I'm like looking at going, oh, no, I should draw all of that again. Just get rid of all of that. And I, but, and I love drawing dread. I love drawing dread. I can't emphasize how much, how, how much I love drawing dread to the point where if I'm doing, like if I'll do thumbnails, tiny little thumbnails on the computer and I'll draw them and it'll, if it'll have dread on it, I'll, I'll start, I'll start noodling a proper dread in there. Like everyone else gets a circle and a, a blob to indicate that a person's standing there. Dread will get the full chin and the full, like the full thing. And then I'll go, oh, that was a bit stupid. I'll not do that again. And then I'll go to pencil it. And I'll think, right, well, I know what dread looks like. So there's hardly any point in doing much detail. I need to detail everything else and not detail dread because I know how I'm going to draw them. And then I'll sit there and about 20 minutes all have passed. I'll be a really detailed pencil drawn of dread. I'll be like, oh, for God's sake, Paul, that's a God damn it. And then I'll go to ink it. I'll be like, I, I ignore all the pencils because I get another chance to draw dread again. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> why? Um, so I love drawing dread. I don't, I think there's definitely, every time I see a drawing of dread even, that I've done, even if it's a good one, I think, oh, I'd like to draw that again. And it's one of the things that, that um, I don't like about digitally drawing dread is that I like having drawn it on paper because I can look at the paper afterwards and go, I did that. Now, that's not to say that, I mean, there's flaws in everything. Everything has flaws and everything has those quirks of your own, uh, the things you can't escape from, the poses that I can never escape from, the, the, the kind of the way I draw hands. I mean, I, I remember I used to look at Alan Davis artwork and one day I realized he draws hands like this where he has the two uh, 
two inner fingers kind of stuck together nearly. And once I saw that, I couldn't unsee it. And every single drawing that he did of hands, they were exactly the same. And it's like, oh, well, if even Alan Davis can't escape some of his own quirks, then what hope for I? I do not know. So, yeah, I mean, I... I and I, it's not just that, it's it's like I do, I mean, I've got to the point now where I try and do about 20 pages of artwork a month, which is sort of a, you know, it's a good amount of work. Um, and I, but you don't really have time to go over it an awful lot. You do it and you go, that was great fun to do and on and on and on and on to the next thing. So, um, yeah, I mean, I enjoy, I enjoy the process of drawing uh, when it's going well. I hate it when it's going badly and I'll redraw and redraw and redraw. But I, I definitely never sit back and go, that's all perfect. Sometimes I'll do a thing and I'll think, ah, that's going to haunt me for a while because that's pretty good. <laughs> and I'm never going to do that again. So like the Chimsky cover that, that I mean, it's, uh, it's really funny because like, um, you know, I, I get a, a text message from a mutual friend of ours who will go, I don't understand why everyone likes this. Now, you know who that mutual friend is just from that, I bet you. <laughs> You go, why does everyone like this cover? What's going on? I go, yeah, it's, it's weird, isn't it? Everyone really likes this cover. And I'd be going, I thought that was a good cover when I did it, actually. <laughs> and now I'm thinking, I'm never going to be able to do another drawing like that again. I'm <laughs> so I sent him, I sent him a, a new cover I've done for 2000 AD. He goes, yeah, yeah. I see you've used the same effect in the background there. So you're tr trying to chase the dragon. <laughs> you go, yeah, God damn it. <laughs> God damn it. So you did, I mean, and I did it for like a few years ago. I did um, a drawing that was basically, um, oh, Deadpool and, and um, uh, oh, what's her name? Harlequin. And it, and it was a sort of Gustav Klimt style. It was the kiss, Gustav Klimt's kiss. And it was drawn with those two characters on it. And I, afterwards I was looking at it going, that's actually really good. It's like, that's beyond me good. That's like good, good. That's proper good. That's, and and that's haunted me for about three or four years. And and I did a paint like ten, I think in two thousand and eight when I when I left my day job and it was just going to be comics was my main income. And I had a mild panic attack because there was no way comics could pay me enough to earn a living. So I started doing paintings, which I then would sell or um, I'd do commissions. And I did a painting that was of uh, Doctor Who. Uh, I can't remember. No, I'd never done any paintings up till then. I'd done maybe, you know, I think of one painting when I was in my twenties. Um, it was pretty poor, and and I'd come back to it. It was like let's have a go of of uh, acrylic paints, and I was like, oh, this is fun. These are I actually am quite good at a painting. Um, I mean, I never got my ambition. Never got beyond like single figures, uh, like single figures drawn there. You know, like one face. That was it. Anytime I tried to go beyond, I was like, "Oh no, it's too complicated. Oh god, oh god, what have I done? <laughs> Why have I thought this was a good idea?" So I do a single figure, and I, it was a David Tennant Doctor Who painting I did. My wife goes, "That was really, that's really good." And that's the last painting I ever did, and it was really good. It's like it's haunted me for ten years. It's like maybe, maybe you could pick up the paint, and everything you do would be as good as that. And then I think. But maybe they won't. Maybe none of them will be any good. Maybe that was a fluke. <laughs> so, you know, so there occasionally you get a little gift um, from whatever uh, whatever uh, muse there exists for comic creators that goes, here you go. This is above and beyond your normal quality threshold. This is this is actually properly good. And you go, shit. Oh yeah, I I actually m might be good at this. And you go, I'll go on to the next page. Then you'll do the next page. You go. Oh no, 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 that was an accident. That was, <laughs> oh God, why did I think I was any good for five minutes? What an idiot. <laughs> so, so you're perpetually chasing it. But I think I enjoy the process drawn. I enjoy storytelling uh, and I enjoy kind of um, taking, a, like I, I've done a Roy of the Rovers uh, one page thing. And they've, I'm like, you know me, I am not the sports guy. I am not the guy you think of when you think, yeah, I, I not not a good sporty person. So um, I was offered to do this. I posted on Twitter. I said, um, "This uh, I'm, I'm going to be doing a Royal Rovers one page. I'm just going to do some googling to find out how many wickets you have in the game." And uh, <laughs> and of course, uh, go, uh, Rob goes, Rob uh, Williams, who wrote it, is like going, "Oh, don't uh, don't, not, don't joke." But it's fun to do. It was fun to do. Like it turns out, drawing footballers kicking a ball and stuff, they're quite balletic, and it's quite a fun thing to do i i have to apologize mike every every one of these things uh, things i've watched with you so far i've seen you ask someone a question and about 
45% of the way through the question, they go, what was the question again? Whereas I think, I think this time, this might be one of the few times where you've forgotten what the questions are because I ramble so much. No, no, I, I'm fully aware of what I asked. I, I'm, <laughs> I, when I arranged this podcast, I was I knew what it was going to be aware. like. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Z- almost zero involvement for me, which really is what people want. They just, just want to hear other people. Yeah, um, I do want to go back. I mean, if you get a chance, I want to go back over some of the John McRae stuff because John's John completely cut me out of that, and I, I demand, I demand justice. Well, I, that was actually going to be my next question. Okay, okay, okay. It, okay. Is, um, because uh, talking to John uh, John McRae and, mm. and we discussed basically like, there, there, there is a, a, a little knot of of uh, comics creators from Northern Ireland. Nah, there's um, not. There's not a knot. There's, I mean, it feels like it because yeah. it feels like it because we make our presence felt. If you, you but, know. But, that, but, but that's my, exactly my point. Is it's not necessarily volume. It, it's yeah. you know you, you uh, um, you've got Will Simpson, you've got John, you've got yourself. Um, yeah, but that's it. Garth, obviously. <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, five. But, but you know, it, it, it's it's that element of um, uh, a, Mike, an, impact, my, an impact not relative to the size of the. The mistake the, you're making there, Mike, is the is the joke about the guy who walks up uh, and he sees this man playing chess with a dog, and and he says to him, "Is your dog playing chess?" He goes, "Yeah." He goes, "That's amazing." He goes, eh, "It's not really. I've beaten him three times. It's not. It's." <laughs> It's not that we're great or that there's a particularly skilled knot. It's the fact that anyone from Northern Ireland doing anything other than blowing up stuff is impressive. That's <laughs> it's all, the fact all, that all opinions on the all. Two th- all opinions on the 2018 forecast are those of the guest and do not necessarily <laughs> represent the opinions of uh, I think, me or rebellion. I think, I think it may not right. So the my genuine thinking is that um, there was a point where Northern Ireland like. Bands wouldn't come to Northern Ireland. Music, musicians wouldn't come to Northern Ireland. People wouldn't come to Northern Ireland. We are an adjunct to, to women. We're like part of Great Britain, but not part of Great Britain. So the fact that anyone from Northern Ireland turns up at all is sl- in, a, in a, a context of the United Kingdom of Great Britain, but not Northern Ireland. The fact that anyone from Nord- with a Northern Irish accent turns up is slightly, oh, oh, that's, what's that? That's like a monkey wearing a hat and smoking a cigarette. What's going on? <laughs> And so, and so we lodge ourselves in your brain because of that brain. I mean, I'm as guilty of that as anyone. It's like uh, Annette and I were, my wife and I were watching um, a TV show about it's an expensive hotel in, in London or something. I can't remember what it is. But the guy, they're all sitting talking about some pop stars about their arrive. And this hotel is like 11,000 pounds a night or something crazy. And the head guy is sitting there and they're all sat around a table. And the, call, and the head guy goes, and so whenever this, the guest arrives, what we're going to do? And I'm like, Oh, he's from here. <laughs> he's from here. He's got a Northern Irish accent. He's from here. We're just so excited to see each other. <laughs> I think I think there's that element of it. There's the kind of you expect to see people from England. You expect to see English accents. You expect to see Scottish accents uh, in in the UK comics industry and scene. You don't expect to see Northern Irish accents. So when when you hear those voices, it's it becomes a slightly it, you know it gets into putting a little pile on its own. And you think, oh, there's a little cluster of them. We're not, but the thing is, like, I mean, I've people who've been involved in the small press Northern Ireland scene. There never really was one because I've always maintained we're scared to gather. The moment, the, the moment too many people in Northern Ireland gather, there might be a problem. So we're we're scared, and also, I mean, we're all desperate to find out. Are you are you, are you Catholic or a, a pr- pr- Protestant? Or something? What? Because I want to know if I should be hanging out with you or not. So. <laughs> So I, I think it's um, like genuinely for me. So John, John was talking about it on his podcast, which I recommend you listen to because John's really funny and he is very, John's always been very open about his career and stuff. And, he, and he's like, he blush, I think, if I said this to him, but he's always been a big hero of mine. Um, and I love John dearly, but he opened a comic shop in Belfast in 1988 or thereabouts. And I had stopped reading comics in, um, when I was about 16, so 86 or so, because I'd been picked on when I was going to uh, uh, school. Someone found me reading Captain Britain. I was going to an all-boys Catholic school. You don't read Captain Britain in an all-boys Catholic school where, they're, where, where the, next, uh, the next, their career arc is um, not let's go to unit. It's like, should we go straight to prison from here? Or will we, you know, will we do an apprenticeship first? Um, so so the, um, the, again, all my opinion. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> Mike, Mike's not in no opinion on this one. So uh, in the 88, when John opened up the comic shop, I saw a poster for the comic shop. And at the time, John's style, I would have said, would be very close to Alan Davis. a very heavy black and white, very pretty, very sort of mainstream superhero stuff, which is where he was heading, I think. Um, and I, he, he said it himself, and I agree with him. There's, there's an interesting, if he didn't end up going down the direction that he did with, with Crisis and stuff, where would his artwork be? You know, would he have been a, a decent mainstream artist or would he have kind of fallen off the map a bit because he didn't have a particularly strong voice? I, I don't know. I mean, it was really, I mean, for me, I was looking at it going, wow, is that Alan Davis drew that? That's amazing. So when I was 18, I couldn't draw for coffee. So um, I went to this comic shop because purely because I reasoned, well, if everyone there reads comics, they're not going to make fun of you for reading comics. I did not, I was, that's how naive I was about comic shops. Of course they make fun of you for reading comics. You just have to read the, the right ones, you know, not the ones they say. So anyway, that, that's, that's how I ended up meeting John from, uh, within that shop. And I ended up working there for a while on, on a Mondays. So that, that's the bit he skipped. He skipped over that. And actually, um, when he was saying he was doing samples, there was, um, I think he would, what he would do is he'd get other people to write out scripts based on comics on the shelf and then he would draw that up and I did that for him on I think it was a, a 2000 AD thing or something where I would basically write the script out based on the the, the story in the comic and he would went away and drew it so that, that was before he I think he, he tied up with Garth and did Crisis and stuff so and then I'd go up to his house when after he was getting after he was do, when he was doing the fully painted stuff in Crisis I'd head up to his house uh, ostensibly to kind of draw in his uh, studio room which was an amazing his parents two doctors and lived in the like John was in the fancy side of town and I was not in the fancy side of town he had a massive house it was like a mansion he had a a, a studio that was basically its own little flat within their house and I'd go up and go oh my god this is incredible uh, and I in the meantime was stuck in a house with you know shared a bedroom with my brother. And uh, in a tight, like a, literally a room that had capacity for a bunk bed in it and nothing else. So, I, and I was sharing a room with him. So, and I would be drawn down the kitchen or something. And so I would head up to John's house and, and sort of draw up there where there was free space. I say draw, I mean, mostly I was watching Kate Bush videos. You know, <laughs> take what you can get. <laughs> Wait, I, I, I wanted to ask, uh, John's career has been defined by... Um... Uh, things like troubled souls, mm. you know that that that's really what kickstarted his his, yeah. his, his comic partnerships career. with and, Garth. And, I think. Well, I mean, I mean, you 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 talk about congregating, but you all seem to want to work together because you've done a lot of work with Garth and John's I've done, done a lot, lot of work, work with yeah, Garth. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's more about Garth wanting to work with people he knows and and likes and and can do certain kinds of jobs. And and I mean, I did. I can't. God, I can't remember the first thing I did with Garth. I think it was a. It was definitely a war thing. Um, Happy Valley, I think it was 2008 or so. And uh, But by then, I'd done loads and loads of work. And I think Garth was, you know, I'd seen some of it. And I think from the impression that Garth had maybe of me was I was a good, solid British comic artist that could probably do a good, solid war comic. And I think, and and the fact that I, that you know, he knew me was probably a, a, a good thing. Um, and so I think, that for that and Garth could pick or choose as artists on on things generally. Um, you think? I mean, it, it turns out in comics you don't have as much power as you think you do. Anyone at any level, there's not the power that you. The only power you've got is to say no, but you've no power to say yes to things necessarily. So um, I did that with Garth, and I think Garth can be very loyal to people that he's worked with. So that that led to more work. So um, yeah, I mean, it is it is funny, that, but I mean, I've worked. I mean, God, I've worked far more with Gordon Rennie. And, and Gordon, you know, Gordon, of course, a famously grumpy Scottish. So, <laughs> you know, I think if you're, I, I, I think I, I've always maintained, um, I think a lot of artists do as well, the, the kind of the checklist of three things, be good, be fast, or be easy to get on with. I can't, I mean, I try and be good, but I can't guarantee it. Like, I, I try and be fast, you know, and I'm reasonably fast. I can definitely be easy to get on with, you know. Um, so that's, that's the thing I've tried to manage most of my career is I'm somebody you want to work with again, not just once, but you want to work with again, you know, the first day, a gig I did, uh, 2000 AD, uh, Judge Dredd, which was, um, Andy Diggle giving me the work. Um, I'd met Andy at, at, uh, the, I think it was the two, the, the first law, uh, Dreadcon in London. 
and I'd bought over a portfolio of stuff, did everything wrong. Um, I bought a full portfolio, like a, like a four inch thick portfolio. I kind of thought I do, he doesn't have to give me any work. I just have to show him I started bad and I got better. So I put all the bad stuff at the start. <laughs> so my reasoning being he will definitely go through 70 or 80 pages of artwork to get to the good stuff. He will definitely see page by page, even small incremental changes. He'll see that. I don't know why I thought that. I know, like, I, I, anyone had asked me advice, I would have said, bring six pages, make sure that the best thing you've got, that's what you're going to show. And don't argue the toss. Do not just show them it and, you know, happily take it. So as it, I went up there, and one of the pages in it was a, um, uh, oh, God, what's it, Durham Red Pick, which I had drawn online. I was just like, I, I was experimenting with uh, internet stuff at the time when I think before lots of other people, because I'd worked in IT and I was interested in it. So I had uh, an early webcam and it wasn't even a webcam. It was a camera that would take a still image every five seconds and it would post that still image to a directory on my computer. And I, what I did then was on the directory on my computer, I shared on the internet. So you could go to my computer directly and see this image update in every five seconds. That's the state of, that was the state of the art for webcams in those days. Um, so I did this and I did this Durham Red piece and I bought the Durham Red piece with me and he kind of was flitted through and he went, he saw the Durham Red piece, he went, oh yeah, so you do that. Yeah, I give you some work. <laughs> like he didn't even look through the rest. I was like, and part of me was going, no, no, look through the rest. I demand, I demand that you do carry out the plan that I had in my head exactly as scripted by me on the way over here on the plane. I demand you do that. But he's got, I'll give you some work. And I was like, going, I mean, I was buzzing. My face was, my, and my wife was with me. She's my girlfriend at the time. It was like, and she'll tell you, like three solid days, I was smiling. My mouth hurt from smiling. And they're like, I was so naive too. I had no idea that, uh, like, it's very easy for an editor to say, okay, I'll give you some work. That's a nice, easy thing for an editor to do. The actual job of giving you some work is much more complicated and um, they, it doesn't necessarily happen. So you can get a promise of work and it may not happen unless you're on the ball and constantly, constantly. Now, as it happens, I'd done some small press stuff with um, Gordon and I'd phoned Gordon and said, oh, Andy said he'll give me some work. And he went, oh, well, I've just sent a dread in, so I'll ask him for you to do it. I went, Oh, okay then. And that is why I ended up on Dread. But here's the point of this story. I'll roll back all the way back was, uh, and why I, I was saying, like, importantly, the thing to do is make sure you're someone people want to work with again is I sent Andy, like Andy had said, whatever, just no deadline, just whenever. So I drew and redrew and redrew those six pages, maybe five or six times. Um, and I finally sent them off and they were overworked and labored and not particularly great. And I sent them to Andy and uh, I phoned Andy and I went, well, did you get them? He goes, yeah, yeah. He says, what do you think? He says, not the best dread I've ever seen. <laughs> and I, I was like, going, Andy, I says, I'll redraw them. He goes, what? I says, I'll redraw all of them. He went, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. I'm going, no, nope, I'm going to redraw them. He's, he goes, why? I says, well, I don't think you would say to me, I'm not going to give you any more work. I think what you would do is you would print them and you would go, these aren't very good. I'll just not bother giving you any more work. And so I kind of figured uh, if I redraw them, you will probably give me more work. And he went, yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> so, so, so I redrew them and I ended up getting more work. And it wasn't too long after that, that, that Matt came on board. And I think Andy handed Matt over a list of artists and there's a, a I mean, anecdotally, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. Maybe this is the story, the myth that we all make up is that um, there's a list, there's a black book of artists you want to use and a red book of artists you don't want to go near with a 100-foot barge pole. And, the, and, and Andy handed over the black book and Matt went, just went, you know, he saw Steve Dillon, his name was in there and then my name was in there as well. And he just thought, well, they must be about the same or at least, you know, there's no, there's no reputational damage to me yet just yet. So it, it was like, yeah, if you want to do some work. And I, I remember doing, um, I mean, this was very early days for Matt as well. And, and uh, I remember doing a convention with Matt and I don't know, I think I've been doing stuff for 2018, maybe for a year or two, certainly not long. And he, he was doing a portfolio review and he said, do you want to come along? And I went, or no, I was desperate to come along. Matt did not offer. I asked, I said, can I come? I love doing portfolio reviews. He says, yeah, I'm not great. I'm not really, I don't know much about art. And so we went along. So I think, I, I mean, I, I'm absolutely certain that he knows what he likes, you know, and, and um, knows what's good for the, the progue. Um, but at that point, I'm saying progue, even though it's, it should be prog. Um, 
I don't want controversy on this podcast. <laughs> this is this is my opinion. It should be prog, um, as in progressive. No, no, no. It should be prog, as in program. I've got myself mixed up. Anyway, anyway, anyway. <laughs> so, not even so got the like, courage of your own convictions. Come on. <laughs> I just forgot. I forgot how I said. I, do you know what? It's been so long since I've talked to anyone that I need to mention the word prog. <laughs> It's, my kids don't care. My wife certainly doesn't care. What are you? What are you talking about, Paul? You've done what now? And the kid, the kids and my wife are going. He's like a child. <laughs> they go. Would you see what I've done? It's a cutout of Judge Dredd. It's awesome. Would you see? They're going. No, nobody wants that. <laughs> yeah, anyway, anyway, I was slightly mad here on my own. <laughs> Wait, you, you, you're. Uh, you worked in IT, 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 hmm. as you mentioned, and uh, you made the decision uh, well, I, I a few don't years work, ago. Worked, worked isn't the right word. I had a, a career in IT. I started yeah, working in yeah. IT at age 14, um, doing, working in a computer store place. I ended up doing tech support and, you know, I'd sales tech support, software installations and, and programming, uh, database programming and all sorts. I did, I did software for Ford's Belfast plant that would calculate uh, tolerances on parts it wasn't very good and i i, I don't want to drive a car that came out of that plant but that's <laughs> that's that's how you're in there and and i ended up like the last job i had was it manager for like northern ireland's biggest charity so i it was a proper career it wasn't you know i i, I dismissively say i worked in it but it, it was a proper career i mean i i went to um i went to my brother's wedding in cork and my dad was there. My dad's uh, kind of lower class, uh, working class Catholic. Working class Catholic aspirations are different from working class Protestant aspirations. Working class, this is a Northern Ireland thing. And again, my opinion, working class Protestant aspirations are, uh, I think, and John would have felt this. So he would have been, you know, it would have been, we want you to be a lawyer or a doctor or, you know, barrister, or here's, here's the run of things. Working class class catholic aspirations are we'd like you to be a writer or an actor or you know uh, something in the arts like a painter you know a portrait painter and i'm like i want to be a comic artist i was constantly you should be drawn this this and the other thing and at university i went i went to university uh when i was 23 to do computer uh, it stuff uh, a degree in software engineer and which i dropped out of i'm not that smart uh so I dropped out in the last year thinking I was going to have an IT a, a comic career, but I didn't, so I was stupid. But anyway, I was in my brother's wedding down in Dublin, uh, or down in Cork, and I have a younger brother, and he's 22, I think, right? So I'm 50, he's 20. So there's a big age gap between us. And I was saying, do you know when you were born, look, I was at university, and I used to do a lot of acting. And he goes, acting? You did acting? I went, yeah. You know, it was like I did a load of plays. I was really good in them, and I would constantly be in cast as either leading characters or you know t t titular characters, title characters. So it was always big roles. And my dad goes, my dad turns to me and goes, "Aye, you should have stuck to that. You were really good at acting." I go, "Hang on, hang on. I just hang on. My IT. Well, I worked in computers. I I was the IT manager for like the biggest charity in Northern Ireland. Like it was hard to go up from there." And, I, and then, and but I, I left that job to work in comics drawing. I ended up drawing Judge Dredd, the character I've always wanted to draw since I was seven. Like the, that, those are two incredible. Like if you achieve one of those two things in your life, you'd think I did all right there. I did both of those things. He goes, yeah, but you were really good at acting. <laughs> Disappointment on his face. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, anyway, that's a funny story. I think it's a funny story. That 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 kind of uh, taking the leap into mm. uh, a, a, a comics career. Oh, I was um, never going to take the leap, Mike. I've ne no way no? would I have taken the leap. No, no. I was I was getting paid. So I don't know what it would be in this money now. But in two thousand, I was getting about thirteen or fourteen thousand pound per annum for two and a half days a week work. So I was on maybe. 25 or 30 grand or something a year for for but i was only working two and a half days so you know it was pro rata so it's really good money and it was two and a half days who would what idiot what idiot would throw that away this idiot mike this idiot um what happened was 2008 was the um financial crisis <clears throat> as you know i'm sure Lots of people in my work suddenly, we had a quite elderly, quite older um, staff, 
and a lot of them were retiring that year and suddenly their pensions were worth not a damn uh the there was a big question about like one of the biggest because we were a charity one of our biggest sources of income were uh, people passing and they would leave their <coughs> they'd leave their houses to us, they'd leave their estates. But what happened is uh, people would leave their houses, they'd be very elderly, and they would have bought their house when their house was worth a thousand pounds. And then now, as they on their deathbed, they go, oh, I don't have very much money. I'll leave my son 500 pounds. I'll leave my daughter 500 pounds. But the balance of my estate, which is the house, I'll leave to a charity. And of course, in the interim between the, the, that old person buying their house in the twenties and now the house is suddenly two and a half million quid, you know, so, and they'd no idea, they'd no idea how much money they had. So this was our biggest um, income was legacies was people. And, and actually I remember there was a couple of court cases where, uh, where family members were basically going, and my mom had no idea how much her house was worth. If she knew it was worth that amount of money, there's no way she would have left it to a charity. It's just no way. Um, and, but at that point, what happened was the financial crisis bit suddenly all of those potential incomes were dropped down because the as I say the biggest income was from uh houses uh, sales of houses and suddenly that was constricted like it just you know constricted the next to nothing and so it looked like um you know the the uh charity was going to be in a lot of financial difficulties and or not quite financial difficulties but it was a it was going to be a tough steer to get through this and at the at the same time the app store had released the had updated so that you could or had not updated it was the creation of the app store on the iphone and for the first time anyone could write an app to put on to the iphone and i had because i'd worked in it and because i was into comics i had been for a long long time thinking with the iphone oh i know how you could get comics on this it would be amazing they'd be really cool because you know i would i would do like a commando size style i would do comics that fit the actual screen so you could just swipe left and right and go through and i thought oh here's a dozen other things i could you could swipe down to go through different layers you could see the colors and black and white and pencils and all these cool things and i sat down with a, a programmer it was a friend's wedding and i i sat at his wedding he sat me beside a friend of his a programmer and we we chatted about this he said oh i'm quite interested in doing a digital book and i said well i'm quite interested in doing a digital comic and he went okay well maybe we should get together and do that i went okay here's all the things i would do and i specify because i i had done program and i knew how to spec a thing up that was achievable there's a lot of times with programmers they'll tell you that what happens is somebody who doesn't know anything about programming comes in and says we want this this and this and this and that's what we sold to the client and the programmer goes you can't do any of those things why 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 um so i'd i contacted al ewing al and i chatted about maybe doing a web comic or doing something and al had written up a thing called murder drum and we we ended up um programming this comic it was super violent but it was 1970s kids comic violent complete over the top future sports stories you probably know some of this stuff you probably remember some of this stuff at the time and we um we logged it up to the app store and it was a really cool little app it was like it, it did things that no comic readers now does still uh and apple basically went oh we we weren't expecting people to do comics um and this is a bit violent, so could you tone down the violence maybe and we'll, we'll think about it? And, you know, it's, it's not quite what we we're expecting. But they basically said, you know, the, the regulations, blah, 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 you can't do this. But at the time, anything on the App Store that was uh, newsworthy, like anything that happened with the App Store was newsworthy. The more uh, First Amendment, the closer to the First Amendment that was, the more newsworthy it became. So one of the earliest apps that was banned from the App Store, I use the word banned, this is the word that all, all the um, newspapers and stuff ran with, was an app that basically was a knife on the phone that when you stabbed someone with the knife on the phone, it would play the, the, the music from, uh, what do you call it, the... the um, Oh God, what's his name? The psycho music. Psycho, so, yeah. Yeah. So, so you go, you make a stabbing motion with a phone. It would, the phone would then play the stab. And it's like a funny, stupid little app. But Apple were like, going, oh God, no, oh God, no, 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 no. That's not what we were. No, no, no. We wanted calculators and things. Don't, don't be doing that. So they, they banned it. And then of course it got worldwide coverage. So we put this app up. It got. Uh, knocked back my friend who'd been uh, on honeymoon had come back and he was the idea was always to get three of us involved in this because he was sort of a businessy guy and he went well what i'll do is i'll put out a press release and and you know i'll just put out a press release about it being banned and he did and suddenly we were being interviewed all over the world like it went from like in it took his honeymoon was maybe two weeks 
so we did two weeks to build the app. We put it in the app store. It was got rejected. And then like three or four weeks later, we put out a press release and the press release suddenly had worldwide coverage and we were taking calls from CNN and stuff. And I was like opposite where I worked was um, a bar. And at the time, most of the senior management had left because of the, the financial crisis. A lot of people were looking at the, the numbers and going, I'm out of here, I'm going. So a lot of the senior management team had left and I didn't really have a boss anymore. And so there was all this kind of upheaval there. And at the same time, there was all this potential over here. And the NBC, NBC Universal got in touch with us and said, can you adapt your app to put our Heroes comic on the app store? We we're like going, yeah, I think. Uh, it'll cost, how much is it going to cost? I don't know. I don't know how much we should charge. They're a big company. Should we charge them like three grand? No, just definitely they could take more than three grand. Let's try 15. Does that sign up right? right? I don't know. So we, <laughs> we went to say 15 grand. I went, yeah, okay. I've got, shit, that was not enough. That was not enough. They said yes straight away. So we, <laughs> so I, I kind of went, I went into work and said, look, I'm not going to be back here tomorrow. I'll see you. They're going, what? I'm going, I've got, I don't know what's going on. It's just the whole world is messed up. I'm going over here where, like, it was unprecedented time. There's no, there's no way to repeat the set of, some weird set of circumstances. But I basically threw the towel in on the basis that, look, everything's kicking off over here. I think we could be millionaires. I genuinely, we were genuinely talking to people who were going, yeah, I think you could get about two and a half, like a quarter of a million investment for this. Um, and we, I've been as well, not only that, but I'd been, um, we'd done this, we'd entered this entrepreneurs competition all within the same, like we're talking like within a month. This is not, this is not over six months or nine months. This is like within a time frame of a month or two weeks or something, very, very tight. Uh, we'd entered this entrepreneurs competition and I did a whole presentation about how I felt the comics industry would be worth, a digital comics industry would be worth, say even, I think at the time I said, look, it, the, the top selling comic is Batman. It sells whatever, 200,000 copies a month. I says, if your entire digital comics industry, the entirety of it is worth the same as one Batman per month, that makes it a multi-million pound industry. And I did this presentation and we got, we got shortlisted. So the idea was we'd win this thing and we'd get maybe 10 grand to do development and stuff. And we got shortlisted to, to, to the top two. And they said to us, uh, look, you might be right, but we don't know because there's no one else doing it. I'm like going, well, I think I'm right. And they're going, well, we don't know. And of course, I was, I mean, in the end, I was right. It was a multi-million pound industry, but it wasn't for me. It wasn't my multi-millions of pounds. So I ended up, I left my day job in computers and went to work for my pal who said, look, come to work for me. You can work for me and what you'll, whatever, you can just do programming on this thing. I'll just keep money pouring into your pocket while you're doing that and we'll do this. And so I did that for a little while. And, um, but again, financial crisis had been happening. Everything was on a major downturn and, uh, you know, it was the only. It was only that set of circumstances allowed me to walk away from the job. The fact that the job seemed to be crumbling away, and the fact that the, this other thing looked like a massive opportunity, like multi-million pound opportunity, um, and I was like, I went to do this, and I was doing it for a little while, and it suddenly dawned on me what I'd done was I'd left a computer job, you know, for another computer job. I was programming. I was programming the back end for NBC's comic reader. It's like, well, this isn't drawing comics. I went, well, I've got like three, I think it was about three grand or something, which in 2008 seemed to stretch reasonably far. I kind of went, I can live, I can live for three months on three grand. Even if I have no income, I can live for three months on three grand. And if I get a bit of work, I think 2008 gave me a bit of work at that point as well. So I've always had work from 2008, but I think I'd, I'd stocked up enough work that I kind of went, well, if I do that work for 2008, that's a month. Then I've got a three month cushion. So that's four months. That's a, you know, that's not too bad. So I did that. That's when I kind of went, this is what I'm going to do now. And I think that was then the start of the worst uh, comic year of my life. <laughs> that's when I got the least amount of paid work. <laughs> that's the way it goes. Great comics. timing, PJ. Great I timing. I know. So, I mean, people said to me before, oh, how did you break into comic? Well, not, how did you achieve kind of escape velocity from a day job? The comics are going, nah, never going to happen for anyone else, mate. Not, 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 no way. But it's like, I mean, this is, I called it, I would have said it was a black swan event. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure you know what a black, you know, the story of the black swan. Uh, and, but for the sake of anyone not listening uh, who doesn't, the idea of a black swan is that um, 
at one point the expression it's like a black swan would have been like saying it's hen's teeth it just doesn't that isn't going to happen and then and you're going to correct me because i'm sure the story's a bit wrong but uh, and then they they went to australia and of course there are black swans everywhere and so a black swan event is an event where i paraphrased a black swan event is one where you know it's inconceivable until suddenly it happens and like the pandemic is inconceivable until suddenly it happens. Of course, it's not inconceivable to everyone. It's just anyone who, everyone walking around the street, not aware of it and idiots who uh, are in charge of our governments. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, so I, I mean, if you're going to leave your day job and do comics, now is the time to do it is what I'm saying. <laughs> no, don't hold on to your day job for dear life. <laughs> don't let that thing escape. So, I mean, for me, this hasn't changed much. I still, you know, I'm still locked in my same room, still drawn. The only difference is my wife and kids are home now. So, I'd, if anything, I'm less self-isolated than I was prior to the pandemic. But there's always that uh, that notion of the big break. You know, you do this and you can mm. move on to a comics career and everything. Uh, but I know. It, that, that, that kind of belies the fact that... Uh, it's something that has to be worked out. And that's, that's, the, that's the one thing that, 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 for me, is, you know, uh, looking at it as a, as a as a friend of someone out, uh, outside um that has defined your career that you have had to just keep working at it you mm. know it, it's not been a boom and stupidity and persistence mike those are my two key strengths stubbornness, stubbornness. absolute <laughs> bloody stubbornness pure bloody mindedness a kind of i, I don't care if you're going to pay me to draw comics or not i'm going to keep drawing them and eventually somebody might pay me um, yeah, I mean, I broke into comics when I was 30, which is quite late, really. Um, although at the time, quite a few, I mean, Jock broke in at the same time. Um, and so he was about 30 as well. I mean, the, all, they, Jock had had a career uh, doing sort of magic gathering cards, I think. Um, who else was there? Uh, Freezer Irvine, uh, similarly aged to me. We all sort of, so, so I, I suspect there was probably a gap somewhere between the 90s and 2000 when it was harder to get in or for some reason people weren't trying as much you know or maybe that's just my experience but it, it did seem like it seemed odd to me that there was and, and definitely jock and fraser were more fully formed than i was that's that's for sure i was i was definitely uh more uh more in the placenta more in the womb still and still cooking um in terms of artistic style and stuff but um i i doggedness and persistence and uh, a kind of inability to understand that I'm beaten is the, my main strengths, really. <laughs> Not knowing when to shut up. That's the other one. <laughs> I mean, it's invaluable on a podcast, mate. <laughs> I've, I've cleared my inbox during the course of this hour. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so, I mean, I, <clears throat> I posted on Twitter the other day. I said, I kind of miss... Because after watching you and John on, on um, your podcast, I was thinking, I kind of miss the days when we would all hang out at conventions and none of us had really broken. John, of course, had. But, you know, you go to a convention, you'd no idea what was ahead of you. you you'd be trying desperately to find editors. And, and, you know, there was that sort of naivety that what would happen would be someone would say, you know what kid i'm gonna give you a chance and then they'd smoke a big fat cigar and and that would be your career and, and your rocket ship and off you'd go and then you realize it's not a rocket ship it's a stumbling it's a, it's a rocket ship built by you know uh, uh built by a bunch of incompetence that is constantly falling down and you have to get back in again and shoot off again and sometimes you get a dull a, a turbo boost but that just makes the crash land and even harder again so it's <laughs> so, Constantly shooting for the moon and constantly falling flat into the ground. <laughs> that's that's ever, but that's the thing. That's everyone's career. There's no, there there are very few people. There's a few people I think who have had a career you would look at and go, wow, they did not stumble once. But then if you look at it and you ask them, they'll go, oh no shit, no no, I'm st I've stumbled here 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 here, and I can't even honestly tell you exactly why I I am not in the ground right now. You know, they they, they often that success. It, you is indefinable and when it happens you don't quite know i mean for me success i think <clears throat> means i used to say um so my, my definition of success before i broke into comics was i get to draw judge dread that was it super simplistic i get to draw judge dread almost naive in its simplicity its simplicity and the first gig i got in 2008 was i got to draw judge dread i was like well where do i go from this i mean everything now is dying and then i kind of thought well i reappraised it. it was like well what is success and i thought well because it's not it's not a single goal as a comic creator. Because at that point you go, 
you know, it's, it's not like you plant your flag and that's it, you're done. It's like, no, you plant your flag and you move on to the next point and then you plant your flag and you move on to the next point. So <clears throat> how do you define success in a, in a sound bite in a way that you can put on a wall and go, right, I understand what your driving motiva motivation is. And I, for a long, long time, I think my success, uh, my definition of success was I get to pay my bills and I get to draw comics. And, but the thing is, those two things are not connected. <laughs> You know, they are not connected. I mean, sometimes they, if I'm really lucky, they're totally connected, but nine times out of 10, they're not, you know, and, and so, I, I mean, I, and I, I can't remember who said it. Somebody said that um, they're, they basically, they're, they get to draw for free, but they get paid to do invoices. And that's, that's kind of, you know, <laughs> there's still the, the donkey work of invoices. But if I, if I get, if I, all my bills are cleared, and I get to draw comics, I, that to me is success, you know. I mean, of course, it's got a wee bit more subtler as time's gone on. I want a bit more control. I want a bit more, um, I used to think that, um, like, for example, writers tend to have much more uh, dry, um, uh, an ability to drive their careers a little bit more than artists because I certainly, I mean, I'm basically waiting on an email saying, are you free to draw this thing? And I would go, oh, yeah, I'm, I'll draw it. Uh, whereas writers are, are always pitching things. Now, they don't always get those things pitched, but they could go, oh, I would really like to write a romance. Well, let's pitch a romance. And that's okay, that got kicked back. So it's a, a war story or it's a thing. But they're, the, they're more in the driving seat. <clears throat> whereas as an artist, you are kind of sitting waiting to see what jobs are going to arrive for you. And so I kind of thought, well, this I need to write stuff. But it turns out you don't really, once you've achieved a sort of... Um, a state where I think people want to work with you. Um, and again, that is, for me, that's defined by I'm easy to get along with uh, and also I'm fairly fast. And so, you know, if, if you say to me, let's do a 30 page thing, you'll get a 30 page thing. You'll not get a, oh, can we knock it back to 11? <laughs> you know, can we do five? Is that, the, is that a possibility? Um, I, will, I will come with you all the way on that journey and get the whole thing finished. So now what I find though is, I mean, a lot of writers, are quite open to me kind of suggesting things and going, wouldn't it be fun if we did something like this? I mean, at that point I can step off the gears and, and, and let the, the thing work away in their head. But you know, the last few projects, um, you know, there's been projects where the thing with Arthur, for example, came out of an initial idea I had, uh, which, I mean, it's nothing like that initial idea, but the initial idea was certainly the seed for it. And, and, um, it will kind of, we hopefully get back to that initial idea if, if we get a chance to. So, uh, and um, I don't get any input on Chimpsky. No, that's not true. I did, I'm like some of the stuff in Chimpsky, for example, um, I think I included the, in the first drawings I did of Chimpsky, which I sent, I included a couple of things. I included him, um, so I dressed him in that kind of uh, jumpsuit thing uh, and the little stripy t-shirt and I think the writer was expecting a, a chimp in a suit, a tie and stuff. And so it changed the character of him a little bit by, by how I drew him. But I also included the, the, um, what, the catapult in his pocket, which wasn't in the script. It wasn't scripted. So, and then of course the catapults become a big important part of it. And I did, um, there's a drawing of Chimsky sort of lying, reading a book, but also flitting a yo-yo back and forth. And, and the writers got back to me and go, yeah, we're, we're going to use that yo-yo. And the next, the next thing he's gonna, he's gonna use that yo-yo in some way. So I'm, I'm getting more of an input, and I'm getting slightly more control. I mean, people know what I, my skill set is now better than they did when I first appeared. So they'll know, you know, if someone goes, who can do a good war comic, who can do a good dread, you know, I, I'm there for that stuff. Um, and, uh, but also I can, I can say to the writer, wouldn't it be fun to do something like this? That would be good fun to do. I mean, those things can still die on the vine. That's no two ways about it. That still happens. But uh, at least you feel a little bit more like if, I, if I'm reaching the end of a game, like um, I think I always think in three month terms. So um, I need a job now. I need a job for when this job finishes. And I need some notion of, of what's going to happen after that. So uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> the... <laughs> If, if at, uh, in the middle of the second month, I'm starting to think, I don't know what's next month. I don't know what's happening. At that point, I can start emailing and writers and going, you fancy doing something? If so, well, it'll be fun to do. And then I can start scheduling things based on that. And hopefully Matt will, you know, Matt will go with those ideas, you know, so. Is it, I mean, you've always got to be careful um, about, uh, you know, when your work becomes popular because, you know, 
artists like Brian is, Bolland come along I, and uh, try and a, steal your characters. Yeah, it's, yeah well, well, becoming popular has never been a worry concern for me, but yes, I, get, uh, but I saw that Bolland thing and he can, he can do those chimps he covers if he pulls them out of my cold, dead hands. That's not true. Of course, of course. Jesus, if Brian Bolland wants to do a Chimpsky cover, let Brian Bolland do a Chimpsky cover. Yeah, but the I one thing I know, the one thing I know for a fact is if someone says, "Look, uh, Brian, we've um we've a twenty six part uh, Noam Chimpsky strip here. You fancy it?" I know he's going to say no, and it's coming to me, baby. <laughs> That's the benefit of being fast and happy to work with, and you know, and going, "Yeah, I'll do twenty six parts. Yeah, let's do that." Gordon's immediate reaction was, don't tell BJ. <laughs> uh, Gordon's been, he's been busily, he's been texting me things like, what, are they all, are they all taking drugs? What's going on? Why are people liking your work now? Gordon, and I, I mean, like, I, I love Gordon. I think he has been, on the one hand, um, the biggest boost to my career, because if it wasn't for Gordon, I wouldn't be working in 2080 at all. There's, you know. Um, I think if, if I'd shown stuff to Andy and Andy going, I'll get you some work, I would have been too timid to phone up Andy and say, where, where, where's this work, please? And no writer would have been in my corner saying, why don't you give PJ that? I might have got a future shot by a year later if I'd seen him again at another convention, but it certainly turbo boosted what I was doing. And he's always been very keen and, and fun to work with. His scripts are great. Um, but he also equally wants me to know who's in charge. <laughs> <laughs> he very much wants me to know that I'm the junior member of any partnership that we're involved in and that I'm instantly changeable, instantly can be swapped out, <laughs> preferably, in, his preference would be swap me out for Henry Flint, but Henry's never available, so I'm always there. Uh, I've got I literally got instructions in the script that says, draw this a bit like Henry if you can manage it. Uh, <laughs> you know. Stuff like ego boost and stuff, stuff that when you think you're doing, and I think he's been keeping me on my toes with the Chimsky cover going, yeah, I don't, this is not that good. I don't know why anyone thinks it is, but I, you know, I know secretly he loves me. He couldn't do without me. <laughs> and, well, that's not true. What I mean is no one else would put up with him. That's what I meant. <laughs> but Nyman has, has come in and has been uh, kind of, well, Instantly popular, really, with, with, with an awful lot of, yeah, of readers. Yeah. Um, it, how is working with him different to, to other writers that you've worked with? Well, I don't, I don't know him. I, sus I mean, I, I, don't, I know nothing about him, right? So I suspect that he's German because of the name. And I know that, like, I've, I've worked with German writers before, and I know that they will sometimes go through translators. So I suspect the scripts are, so I don't know how he got the scripts to, to Matt in the first place, but I suspect they're translations from German into English. So I don't think there's a correspondence we can have. So I will send off sketches and stuff and uh, I will get little notes back, but they, they always look like they've gone through Google Translate. <laughs> Wait, um, I'm going to have to round this off in a, in a second. because I've got, I, I mean, I've, It's I've only got been two hours. <laughs> I could keep going. Matt, don't go. Or Matt. <laughs> Mike, How don't dare go. you? Mike, don't go. Matt! Don't leave we me here. We have known each other for 20 <clears throat> years. I would still be talking to this screen when you hang up. And, and <laughs> don't go. Anyway, go I on. Hate, I hate to tell you, during the course of this chat, uh, my internet's gone off several times. So, I know. Uh, I know. Yeah. I've seen you talk. I've seen you take your earpiece out. I've seen you talk to Catherine. And I thought, you know what? Sod it. I'm just going to keep talking and hope he comes back to me. <laughs> <laughs> which is which is very much how I courted my wife as well. <laughs> um, well, I, I just want to round it off by, by uh, talking a little bit about the future because, you mm. know, it, uh, Chimpsky's been, uh, been a hit. Yeah. Um, uh, it's clear that, that, that uh, you know, you, you have a uh, history with 2080, you have a dedicated following with 2080, um, but I know that you've always wanted to work more in American comics. Um, you've you've done a couple of things. You did battlefields hmm. uh, with Garth, and you've got the um, uh, the Dead Reckoning book. Uh, yeah, which, which is uh, string bags. Is that it's string bags? Yeah, the string bags. It's the name of the plane. It's, it's the nickname they had for the plane because, like a a, a, a a shopping bag, a string bag of shopping, it could carry anything. That's that's why I thought it was because it had lots of strings in it. That's how simple and naive I am. But it turned out no, that it was in reference to the shopping bags that people would have had. Well, I, I was, I, I, 
my reaction when I heard the title, because uh, I know Gary, who, who runs mm. uh, Dead Reckoning. I love Gary. And, he's great. Uh, oh, he's, he's an amazing chap. Uh, and uh, he told me what the title was. I was like, string lights? Because <laughs> all, all the Garth stuff has been like, you know, eagles in flight and all this. <laughs> and string mags. But, yeah. it, you know, there is a historical reason. For yeah. That. Oh, yeah. Um, but it, you, you, you've... I mean, that's an original graphic novel. So you say it's like, what, 120 odd pages? No, 174. Um, 170. Wow. Yeah, that's a long book. So that's taken you like a year of, 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 yeah. of your time. Um, yeah. where, where do you see your uh, career go? Because, like I said, I know you, 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 you'd like to do more American comics, but um, do well, you I have mean, an eye all, on where it's going to go? All bets are off right now. That's the first thing. All bets are off right now. Um, I, I, chat, I chat a lot to, well, I chat sometimes to the, the sort of the Irish mafia, sort of Declan Shalvey and Stephen Mooney and, and those guys and Nick Roach and, and guys. And a lot of them are saying, like, I mean, God, if when Declan's been told to down tools, you know, the American comics are, are taking a little hiatus. So, um, oddly, uh, coincidentally, um, because I'd spent a year drawing this graphic novel, I thought, oh God, I, I want to do some 2000 AD work. I'd be, I'd be very happy if the next year of my life, pardon me, is just stuff for 2000 AD, just because I can do it and it gets printed and there's feedback and I can do another thing and it gets printed. And th that, that change of story, that the fact that, you know, um, so I, like stuff I've got coming up in 2000 AD next are, um, I've done a destroyer strip for uh, the battle special coming up. Um, so it's World War Two stuff, and and I I had enough distance from the last World War Two stuff. I would jokingly say to Rob Williams quite frequently, "I'm never drawn. I'm done with World War Two stuff. I'm done. I'm done." And then I'd said to him, "I got an email from Keith asking me if I want to do a war story, so I'm doing that." <laughs> it's like, you know, it's eight pages. That's nothing. That's not like eight pages. Nothing that drips off me. Eight pages. I can do eight pages accidentally when I trip over something. I can draw eight pages. Um, so. I've got that, but I've also got a thing called uh, Department K with Rory McConville, which is going to be in the kids special and the, the region special. Um, so I, I kind of done so much stuff where I'd practically vanished because you're drawn, you know, you're drawn for a year, you disappear. And then, the, you know, it's like you're hibernating and you've gone. So I did a little, little bits and pieces of 2000 AD stuff. And I just, I came out of it thinking, oh, I just want to do stuff for 2000 AD for a while. I mean, I, I, if it, I wanted a little bit more control over what I was doing. So it was a wee bit more like the Department K stuff came out of an idea story. And I, as, uh, Rory and I were batting around. So it was a bunch of things that I'd suggested that he'd crafted into a great little story. Um, and so... I, I'd already planned this year to do a lot of stuff for 2080 if Matt will have me, you know, so that meant I kind of even wrote on my to do checklist. I, I would like to do more covers this year. I've done, I think up until that Chimsky cover, I had drawn four, four covers for 2080 in 20 years. Like that's nothing. You know, there's four covers is nothing. I thought no, I, I want to do more covers. I'm going to try and pitch a cover a month stupidly like an idiot i always think i'm going to do something like that and then they never do any of it so I've, I've got i think i've got two more covers in the bag for 2018 i so um but I, you know i'd like i just wanted to do more stuff because it it does i think my temperament is much more um <laughs> dog seeing squirrel that's <laughs> that's my temperament <laughs> It's like, oh, oh, what you, oh, like a cartoony thing. Oh, yeah, I'll do that. Oh, what, you want a super realistic thing? Oh, yeah, I'll do that. You want a black and white noir thing, but with like a tinge of green? Oh, God, that sounds amazing. Yeah, well, I'll do that. I'll do that. And only 2000 AD affords you that opportunity to do those things. Um, sometimes the feedback is great. Sometimes the feedback is slightly crippling. Sometimes there's no feedback, and that's the most depressing thing of all. Um, but there is feedback. And, and I mean, American books, I think, weirdly, was it last year or the year before I did a one page X-Men thing? And that for me was like, I, with Al Ewing, Al suggested me for it. I thought, I've done my X-Men thing. Do you know what? I'm not fussed if I work for Marvel or DC. I, you know, I'm like 50. I don't care. I, you know, I kind of, I, I, do see, I do see books. I think, oh, that would be a fun book to draw. And then I think, but someone's already drawn it. So I mean, you're not going to get doing that book. Um, and I, you know, Again, it comes down to, do I get to pay my bills? Do I get to draw fun comics? I think are the two things. So, I, I mean, certainly there, you can, and you can plan whatever you like, you know, man plans, God laughs. There is, you can, you can decide, here's the way I want my career to go. Um, I had had intended, for example, to sit down um, and do a kind of 
Star Blazer style sci-fi thing that would be kickstarted. That's gone out, out the window. Um, I had intended to do a book with John Repian for a publisher, a graphic novel. Um, that's gone. You know, that, you know, these are all a, pa a pandemic responses. That's out the window. Um, I would like the, the Folklore Thursday thing I do with John every Thursday where John does a tweet and then I do a little uh, comic strip around that tweet. Um, you know, July is when it's sort of coming up on one year and I want to you know, I wanted to find a publisher that would print that as a as a nice coffee table edition with kind of the comics on one side and a little essay on the other about the piece of folklore. You know, those that might happen, that might not. That's good, but but I think I I want more autonomy. But at the same time, I don't necessarily want to tie myself to one project for a year again. Not not you know, I, I if if I were for example, if I was lucky enough to be offered a book. And somebody goes, yes, yeah, 12 issues a year, 20, 20 pages. I go, right. And, it, and is every issue about people talking in corridors? Because ah, I might, you know, it, it would be, no, it, this, this is going to be different. And you can do different styles and you can do different things. I go, yeah, I'm definitely up for that. That would be fun, fun to do. So, um, yeah, I mean, as long as my bills are paid and as long as I get, I mean, uh, bills paid sometimes mean doing TV work or doing something that's not, you know, not necessarily comics related, but um you know, Matt and 2008 have been always really good to me. Uh, there's always, anytime I have asked for work, there's work there. Um, it would be too kind of presumptuous to think I, I, I will expect to work for 2008 all year. But if I do work for 2008 all year and it's my only outlet, pff, you know what? That's, that's a good, that's a good gig in anyone's life. You know, that, that I would be very happy with that. And definitely there's more stuff coming from me from 2008 and, and there are more things I'd like to do as well. So. Brilliant. Well, um, I'm going to have to round this out because I... Because it's, it's three <laughs> days later and you haven't shut up. <laughs> uh, it's like old days. Like old days. Just, it's uh, not, Mike, because we're all... Because at this point, we can see eye to eye to each other. And in the old days, <laughs> in the old days physically, that would never be possible. And you did, know it. <laughs> did you not notice that I've, I've actually angled... You've been looking down. It, it, you know, so that I'm... You, 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 know, you can feel nostalgic that I'm, uh, I'm still looking down at you. <laughs> Oh, Lordy. Well, thank you very much. It's been lovely chatting to you. Absolute pleasure. Um, if people want to find you online, where can they seek you out? Oh, if any, I mean, if anything, they can't escape me online. Uh, Paul J. Holden at, uh, on Twitter at Paul J. Holden on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Holden Repian, which is where I post my uh, Folklore Thursday stories early. So if anyone subscribes to that, it then pays a little bit of money. They can get to see those comics early. Uh, and uh, my blog, my website is www.pauljholden.com. And where I kind of post everything now, and I do a regular thing where I kind of, I look at how my week has gone and what I've done in the week and kind of post. So I think if you're, um, I think it's actually a good resource if you're interested in the sausage making element of comics and, you know, what's a working artist do. Um, not that kind of sausage, Mike. I saw your eyebrow. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, I post that partly for myself just to go, what have I done this week? Is it, have I done anything? Have I, and you, you look at it, you go, oh no, you did three seven pages. That's all right. That's not bad. Um, so yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd, so yeah, you can find I'm trying to put out as much good things into the world as I can. I think um, God knows we all need it. Well, thank you to PJ for that. A lot of fun. Great to have a chat with him. I think he might be going slightly stir crazy uh, in, in lockdown. But uh, if you've not picked up the Noam Chimsky storylines, uh, get some back issues and really dig down into that. It is an awful lot of fun. Now, a series that is an awful lot of fun was The Simping Detective, which was Cy Spurrier and Fraser Irving series that ran a number of years ago in the Judge Dredd magazine and then, well, literally broke into 2000 AD uh, later on uh, and uh, ended up in the trifecta. Uh, storyline in 2000 AD. Steve Morris is a comics critic and writer, uh, somebody I've known for a very long time, so I got him onto the podcast to talk about Simple Detective. Uh, it's a series that he really enjoys and has a lot to say about. So uh, yeah, here we go for another deep dive on The Simping Detective. Do you want to introduce yourself? Because uh, I know your work, and uh, anybody who's, who's uh, into their comics journalism will know your work, but... Uh, let us know who you are. Yes, uh, I am Steve Morris. I am the editor-in-chief for ShelfDust.com, which is a comic book website which covers comics one issue at a time. 
the idea is that every essay or article or feature we put on the website is just about one single issue of a comic. Um, so that means we do things which are like uh, uh, annotating some issues or we do things which are critical reviews or we do things which are more about um, character or more about art and craft. Every single piece is about one comic. So the idea is that over time we're building up a shelf essentially of all these old comics and giving people a reason right now I want to have a look at them again, pick them up off the shelf, brush off the dust, hence the name, and uh, give them a read. Excellent. Um, my wife has just come back, so there may be some noise in the back. But we, we're going to talk about um, The Simping Detective, uh, which is Simon Spurrier and, and Fraser Irving's... Uh, uh, well, I'm, I'm going to leave it up to you to explain. What, uh, uh, for those who haven't read it, what, in your view, is The Simping Detective? The Simping Detective is the noir underbelly of a world which is already mostly a noir underbelly. Um, it's an even darker and stranger and more fetishistic sort of uh, area of uh, Mega City One, where um, a detective um, called Jack Point, who is formerly of the um, Judge Squad and is now working undercover as a Wally, or alternatively a clown, um, is trying to get by um, doing his lecturer's best to be an alcoholic, uh, woman chasing, private eye, who sort of gets his cases right and ultimately comes good in the end most of the time. Let's talk a little bit about the, the, the setting and, and, and uh, most importantly, the character of Jack Point, who, who is the simping detective. What's your view on, on what Spurrier uh, and Irving did with this because it, it, it's playing with noirish uh, cliche and, and form and everything, but with that fundamental contrast that makes uh, that makes it so much about Mega City One. You know, what, what, what's your feelings on on how they set it up and and uh, the choices that they make with Jack and with the setting? I think the clever thing about the series is the way that it is always setting you up for a extra twist. So when you're reading the stories, you get brought in very quickly to the idea that this is going to be a story with all the noir trappings that you might expect. But at every stage, there's either some kind of twist on the character or some twist on the narrative or the plotting style. And at every point, he's trying to catch you out. And it gets to the point essentially where you are trying to work out if you're going to be caught out in a second or if you're not going to get caught out in a second and if you're actually going to get tricked by something or if you should believe the real thing and essentially the series is kind of about that sort of duplicity um, which comes up in the series itself um, Jack himself is uh, dressed up as a, a Wally so he's he's wearing the strangest clothes he looks like a clown he's got a massive bow tie red nose all the clown paint all the strange clothing but he's actually one of the more rational minded in a sense um, um, judges that they've had uh, in, in 2000 AD, I think, uh, or, or actually it's from Judge Dread magazine, I believe mostly. Um, and it's that initial appearance um, that you get from him. And then the twist is that he's actually a very competent detective. Then the twist is actually in some senses, he's not competent at all. And he's always completely out of his depth, has no idea what's going on. And it's that, that's the core of the series, I think, is the idea that the reader is trapped in this maze with Jack, who sometimes is ahead of the game and sometimes is completely lost and doesn't know what's going on. And it's about watching him trying to grapple with how he's going to get out of this mess that he's in now and what he's going to do next to you know, keep himself not only safe from the various villains, antagonists of the series, but also from his friends, because all his friends are also out to kill him. I mean, it, it, it is that classic noir setup, isn't it? it it's it's um, somebody that you might not necessarily like, but who you end up rooting for just because they're in a bind and you want to see how they get out of it, really. Yeah, and the, and the thing about this series as a, as a whole is that it's, it plays by one of the noir conventions which might only be one that works for me which is the further and further you get into the story the less you're really certain what's actually going on um, it's so 
um, overly structured in a sense. So when you read the story, um, you can kind of get the main gist of what's going on, but it's going to take a few more rereads to actually understand what has happened. And even then there's going to be some points where you're a little bit lost. Um, as a writer, Cy Spurrier is someone who um, is hyperverbal. He's uh, constantly throwing extra words at you and he will constantly um, pull the rug out from under you um, with delight, I think. Um, as you're reading it, you can kind of sense him laughing as he's writing the script, hopefully laughing as he's writing the script, because he knows that he's got the readers completely lost, but also completely enthralled in what he's doing. And in that respect, it's perfect that he's prepared up with someone like Fraser Irving, because uh, Irving's artwork is, it's already um, warped and um, strange to look at. But the thing is, he's actually playing a lot of it very straight. And when you're starting off with something that's weird and it just looks weird, you get the appearance that things are going very, very strange, very, very downhill. And actually they know the whole way through what they're doing and they know um, the world they're putting together and they're trying to bring you in to make you part of that warped world. Um, you can tell as I'm trying to describe it, I'm getting lost in it myself because I find it, I, I, I really enjoy the series. I find it very confusing at the same time. And I think that's part of the, uh, the effect is meant to be sort of this hedonistic sort of spiral downwards through the, the, the worst parts of the city. And um, Irving is someone who can um, get you to a point where you're watching the strangest things on the page. Every page you notice know, some strange cats in the background or the actual architecture is weird. Or, and you just start taking it for granted because you just think, well, of course it's like that. This is what it's like here. And it, it's a brilliant way of drawing you into the world. So you can see like the two artists together, that, you know, Cy and Fraser, their work together is all designed to just get you really really lost inside the work that they're doing and you take these touch points of jack is essentially the person to root for and everyone else is someone not to be trusted but within that you've got this whole storyline where anything can happen you're not sure what's going to happen next and that's the thing that i think is the most enjoyable part of the the whole series just you never know what comes up in the next page and half the time neither does jack there's, um, there's obviously a, a, a very strong element that, that is Mega City One. He is an undercover judge. Um, there are uh, uh, things like the Raptors and Galen DeMarco, who we'll come on to talk about in a bit. Um, do you do you think the series needs to be set in in, in Mega City One? Do, do you, is there a point you ever feel that that holds it back, or is that always an advantage? I think it's a real advantage. Um, I think one thing that comes through a lot of the time with Cy Spurrier's work is that initially you might read it thinking, oh, he's not invested in what he's writing about on a, on a sort of a, a franchise property like that. Like if he writes the X-Men or something, because he's got um, a, a quite sardonic voice, he's got a good sense of humor. You kind of wonder if he's, making, if he's just making fun of something. Then the more and more of it you read, the more you're aware that he actually knows every single small detail about these characters, this world, he knows exactly what he's doing. Um, in the first few stories that he writes for, uh, for Jack, he is referencing some very obscure 2000 AD continuity from stories past. And as the series goes on, he just keeps making little references to things that have happened or characters that we would know about from elsewhere. And it wraps into this idea that um, 2000 AD's world, Mega City One, it's so much bigger than the world we're presented perhaps in the, the flagship series, the Judge Dredd series. And having someone like Jack Point in that world actually enhances the whole thing so much more. Because you're getting, with, with Dredd, you're normally getting quite a straightforward um, point of view, essentially. There's always that forward momentum, the character's always thinking ahead and in his mind, he's got a logic that he's working through. But when you read something like The Simping Detective, you're reading something where the logic isn't actually as logical as you would, would expect it to be, and you never know what he's 
planning or thinking and seeing that within an established um, city like Meg City One, it just uh, it brings out this idea that there's so many more points of view that are available to people and there's so much more to see from it. Um, I think with having um, Angel Town and also having um, as the villain, uh, well, as a sort of villain is the sort of corrupt judge, uh, Judge Davies. Uh, I think it's Davies. Um, with the corrupt judge, um, right there at the top you're immediately getting the complete inversion of what you normally expect which is normally the judges are fascists but they operate within that sort of fascist approach and you kind of expect um, them to do, work in a certain way in this series you've got a protagonist who is dressing like someone he isn't and you've got an antagonist who is um, subverting all the rules that are meant to be the authoritarian rules of Mega City One. So you immediately you've got these two opposing points who are just completely throwing you off and not really giving away what's going to happen next. Um, every other character comes in as well is doing something to kind of throw you off guard. So when the femme fatale first shows up, um, it actually turns out that it's Galen DeMarco, the former judge, who was in love with Judge Dredd and um, kind of went rogue. So you're not getting a femme fatale who is this sort of dodgy, unexpected, unpredictable um, force of chaos because she's rooted in the, uh, the systems of order and power that the judges operate in. I think it'll operate twice there. But then you get the other characters um, who show up like the actual main villain is a guy who will never show his face to anyone. You never see him. The boss of everything is um, only appears um, in disguise um, and as a sort of twist into one of the stories. Every single time they bring in something that might seem logical or part of the expected noir standards, you are getting thrown something completely unexpected and unpredictable and you're left to try and work out how these different chemical elements are all going to work together and if they're going to explode or if they can be contained and the fact that it's all happening within a 2000 AD um, sort of uh, landscape is so much more entertaining because you're essentially seeing Sysbury and Fraser Irving working out how much they're able to get away with and what they can try and throw at you next and you're not only trying to work out if the readers are going to kind of follow it you're also trying to work out if the editors are going to allow it to happen so it feels quite subversive in that way as well um, which uh, it just makes the whole thing so much more entertaining i think spirit has often said that uh dread for him is not a character he's particularly interested in just for many of the reasons that you've just gone into, you know, he, he's pretty straightforward. Um, you're either doing it as a straightforward action cop thing, or you're having to tackle the big issues uh, around the judicial system. So, um, Simply Detective is much more his wheelhouse in that it is touching on those same issues, but as you say, it's inverting everything. So, uh, and that, that's reflected in um, how everybody looks, like you say. Uh, and I, I, I always felt that this is a natural extension of the concept of future shock. You know, whenever we think about future shock and Joe Stead, we think about the footsies, you know, people driven mad by, uh, by the intensity of living in the future. Um, but with Simple Detective, you, it's one of those series where you see that people actually adapt. They, they, uh, they kind of take on the insanity of the city and they come to represent it. And the fact that Irving, as you say, plays that with such a straight bat it makes it almost even more ridiculous that nobody is talking about the fact that this is man, this man is dressed up like a clown, but apparently is a private eye. It's, it, I mean, it's sublime. One of the stories midway through this run with the character who pops up maybe two or three times a year, I think, is a story which plays on the the, the, the footsies particularly. There's a story where there's a man who's been, um, he's, he's gone into the, um, the ice cubes and Jack goes to visit him and he's basically gone completely mad and they're not quite sure 
why or what's going on. And Jack's role is to kind of work out why this footsie is now, um, you know, he's now gone on a murder rampage, killed about 20 people, and everything's kind of gone to hell. So Jack goes off and he works out essentially that there's a massive conspiracy of gamblers and they have set this man up to slowly go crazy over years so that he will ultimately snap at some point. And then the game is, how many people will he murder once he snaps? And the person who gambles and bets closest to that murder count wins. And so immediately there's that idea that, you know, um, Spurry's playing with, which is this whole city is out to get people. Everything, everything is designed to make you lose your mind and, head, and, and be sent to prison. Um, it's almost like this man had no choice but to snap and, and, and go wrong. So again, you've got this idea that um, there's this inversion of, of everything and the system is playing against, uh, normally in a, in a noir story, the system plays against the lead character. But seeing the lead character trying to work the system, which is itself corrupt and taking out other people, is a really interesting and novel approach, especially for something like um, the Judge Dredd uh, world where you don't normally see something like that. There's this base level corruption in the city because um, Judge Davies is in on the gambling ring and in fact, he rigs the game at the end um, and he sets Jack up to uh, have to kill this man because then it adds the tally up by one more. So he, he, gets, his, uh, he gets his figure in. And it's, it's, it's really interesting to see someone um, having so much fun with authoritarianism in that way. Because everyone is corrupt at the top. That's how it works in the wild stories. But what you're seeing is how that's actually playing out in the lives of other people. It's, it's classic at the same time. It's nothing like the classic stories. I mean, for, for me, it, it's, it's really interesting to um, see something so thematic and, and set in Dread World, you know, it, it, uh, Spurry and Irving are, are playing with noirish uh, cliche, like we said. Um, you know, and it, even the title is a reference to uh, um, uh, Potter's The Singing Detective, uh, which itself was a kind of tragic comedy. But in the the history of Judge Dredd strips, like I say, it, it's it's rare to see something that is so thematic that is that is dealing with an established genre an established uh, uh, way of telling stories, playing with it, flipping it on its head, you know, tacking close to some cliches. And, you know, you've got, you've got his internal monologue, which uh, um, kind of rumbles away. Do you, do you feel that that endures throughout the, um, the strip's history or, or does it begin to slip its moorings a little bit and become its own thing? I think it, build into it even more as it goes on um uh, assuming that the collection that i have is in chronological order which is not the case um i know that it's not quite in chronological order but um the last story in the collection is probably the most noirish of all of them um which is a story called uh, uh, nobody know how it's the one where he wakes up with a body in his apartment and he's got to work out why there's no body in his part and what he's going to do about it and it's again the sort of the classic noir setup something is wrong and i'm framed and what's going on how am i going to, to get out of this one but i suppose as it goes on there's that balance of um the, the sort of the sense of thriller and the sense of farce which i think is something which is really important to judge dread and meg city one as a whole you know at all times there's always going to be that element of, of pantomime in it, in a sense, because the satire has to be um, sometimes just have no subtlety to it whatsoever. Um, sometimes the satire just has to be completely pantomime in order for it to work. And in a story like, um, like this one, um, the solution is clever and noirish, but it's, kept uh, the, the the momentum's kept up through the elements of farce which he puts into it so 
Um, you keep returning to the body, you keep getting people knocking on the door, he keeps having to, to, to put people away. And every single time he opens the door to a new person and um, closes it on them, the response is shown from the point of view of the dead body, which is one of those things which on a, in a film, if you watch it, you think that's ridiculous, that's so silly. In the comic, it is simultaneously really, really silly and really, really like tense. It just builds up these two separate elements at the same time. So again, you're not quite sure if this is going to be a story which ends with something being resolved happily or uh, with everyone kind of getting away with it, or if it's going to end up being some kind of tragedy. You just don't know what's going to come next. I think um, the great team play into noir quite a lot, especially with the, the narrative. I think it helps that Fraser Irving um, is the sort of artist who will be able to leave lots and lots of blank spaces at the sides of his panels. So Spurrier can write his narrative nonsense because half the time the narrative is there to throw you off again. Um, but uh, I do think um, as they go on, they always keep the noir edge and play into it as much as they can, but they do go off into different forms of pantomime, different forms of farce, and, and they try and play into different styles of humour. Um, one thing I found quite interesting about this is how much it feels like a precursor to something like uh, Seven Soldiers of Victory. And uh, a lot of Grant Morrison's writing, actually. Um, there's, a, there's a prose story here, which is illustrated by Irving, and that came two or three years before Morrison did the same thing with Batman. Um, but at the same time, there's also an issue which is essentially looking at the world of cosplay, which is something Morrison does in Seven Soldiers quite often in his Volunteer series. And it's interesting seeing a sort of more uncensored version of that satire play out. Because again, I don't think Spurrier really uh, listens to editorial notes. Uh, if he wants to say something or put something into his story, it ends up getting into the story. Um, and if he does get edited, I am really worried about what the initial draft of his scripts must look like because there's some strange stuff in, this, in, in, the, in the finished product. But um, seeing him um, basically turn that old-fashioned noir style towards something which is more inherently modern, like cosplaying and um, conventions, that's a really interesting dynamic as well. And again, it's that mix of the, 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 the weird sort of um, farce of, of everything that's going on, but also the, the way it's played so straight and it's played so seriously. It's interesting that you, uh, you bring up Morrison there because um, they're quite similar writers in that they're, they're very keen to engage in verbal, <laughs> verbal um, showmanship. You know, uh, uh, there's there's a lot of intelligence there. There's a lot of cleverness with language and with plotting. And um, I mean, I hadn't thought about that angle that that at 2000 AD at the magazine, a writer like Spoer can get away with a lot more than Morrison could necessarily do at, at, at one of the big two. Uh, so it, it's, I mean, I. I I think this is stretching it a little bit, but to see them as two sides of, of a, a similar coin, um, you know, one, one that is unfiltered and, and learning as he goes. And that's certainly um, my feeling about his 2000 AD work is you, you, you can see him learning his craft as he goes. Whereas Morrison comes in and he's like, you know, this is how things are. This is the, um, um, my style. This is how I'm going to present things. Um, with, uh, with the Simpin Detective, um, do you think the do you think there are any missteps? Do you think there are avenues that it goes down that that uh, perhaps it, it shouldn't, or that it doesn't necessarily explore fully? I think in noir, the the way that women are presented is usually as a threat or an item, and in a series like The Simping Detective, where every aspect of noir is meant to be hyper-exaggerated, the, the difference between satirising that and embodying it becomes quite difficult to walk sometimes. And I think at some points, um, 
there are moments where you read the series and you think, actually, I know you're um, coming at this, hope, uh, I believe from a, a feminist perspective, where you're trying to puncture some of the more misogynistic elements of noir. However, you are kind of just presenting it. And like I say, with someone like Fraser Irving drawing something, everything feels slightly surreal and exaggerated to start with. Um, and when you have someone like him on the artwork and there's a scene where, uh, where Galen DeMarco is, um, she's introduced um, uh, undercover as a stripper, it's hypersexualized, and you can see the point that's being made is that she is least visible when she's most visible because that's how all the men in the room are seeing her. At the same time, in, in, a, in a comic book format, I think there's more ability to focusing on a single moment in a film or a TV show, any other medium, something like that would be kind of skipped very quickly and the point would be made very quickly without it being something that lingers. In a comic book, something has more lasting power if she can stay on the page as long as she wants. So I think there are some issues with the, the, the way the women are presented, um, but I would say it's, it's because it has, in a sense, to be hyper exaggerated. It has to be stylized so strongly in order for the the series itself to make sense. If you've got an ultimate um, corrupt villain, if you've got an ultimate morally dubious hero, you've got to have the ultimate sexualized femme fatale, in a sense. And that then, um, she then gets replaced by a second femme fatale later on, who's more of a traditional femme fatale is called um, Anne Frope, uh, Miss Anne Frope. And again, that character, is, she plays off, the, the two female characters play off quite similar to each other. And there's not, there's not um, you, you're playing the same idea twice, essentially, I feel. Um, one, the first time is more successful than the second time because Galen DeMarco being a former judge and having that history, there's more in her to, to explore and more to develop. And I think that's why she becomes the recurring love interest as the series goes on. Miss Anthrope essentially shows up and embodies all the ideas of a femme fatale without really contrasting them. Now I'm saying that, and I've not read, I think, her final appearance, which is in Jokers to the Right, which is the story that leads into Trifecta. Um, and I can't remember exactly what happens in that one. Um, so it might be that one actually does get reversed again and is more brought into it. But as it stands, I think there is that potential issue with the, with the series is that when you're exaggerating everything for satiric effects, sometimes you're just putting up a loudspeaker to something which is problematic rather than puncturing it. You're inflating it rather than puncturing it, not to keep a metaphor up. Well, I, I mean, this, this is a fascinating uh, line of thought. Um, because, as you, as you say, DeMarco is replaced by a misanthrope. And then you get SJS Judge Kovacs as well, who is uh, uh, um, an extreme stereotype of, of uh, uh, almost a um, kind of dominatrix style uh, character who, who, who comes in and um, is very stern, very strict, supposedly cutting through the crap uh, that, uh, that Jack is serving up. Uh, so it, it's... I mean, I agree. I agree. It's 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 a uh, um, it's difficult to represent uh, and undermine and overcome those stereotypes that are present in the in the uh, genre without, as you say, exaggerating them. Uh, but I, th I think that's that's fundamental in Judge Dredd's world. It, it's it's one of the perennial problems with Judge Dredd is is that when you're dealing with satire and quite subtle satire sometimes as well, it, it is a trap that is so easy, not not just for the creator to fall into, but for the reader to fall into as well. Yeah, and with something like this series as well, um, it's when you're dealing with a character who's in a marginalised group. Um, these these are these are white women um but at the same time um there's every other character is presented in the same sort of fashion whatever is their defining trait is the thing that is dialed up to 15. so when dread shows up himself he 
he is almost treated as a parody of himself. Um, Jack Bonnet knows exactly what Dredd's going to do at any time, and he can manipulate Dredd so easily and so effectively. And considering Dredd is the main character of the entire, you know, the entire series, it's really interesting to see that Jack can step in and just twist him around his finger, um, because he knows the the beats of Dredd's um, character. He knows exactly what Dredd's going to do, when he's going to do it, how he's going to do it. And I suppose that is that is very similar, in a sense, to the way the the, the female cats are presented. They're given a noirish trait of some kind of a role or purpose, and that is just delivered as a firework. It just exploded out towards the reader. So when you get any character, whatever the tra- trait's going to be, that trait is made explosive. It's made really, really noticeable. You've got a character like Kovacs who comes in, and she's the sort of traditional, um, the knife that cuts through all the butter. Um, that's not a thing people say, but I'm going to use it. Um, I like it. I like that. it. Stick with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She she's basically the, the the clean blade. So whatever she does is essentially the rule of law, and she cuts through the nonsense that that exists everywhere else. She is again presented as um, this incredibly uh, sort of competent but strict and, and, and strange person as a result. So when you do even get someone who is presented as the dominant face of authority, the, the rational, you know, uh, actual um, law abiding person, she is presented as being someone who is so into the law and so devote to what she's, do- devout to what she's doing, she is causing a problem in her own way. Uh, and she is seen strange compared to someone like Jack. I suppose the idea is that in in noir, everyone is meant to be grey. They're meant to be morally dubious and un, unpredictable. But in the world of 2000 AD, it's dominated by the idea of the black and white mindset. So when you have a character like um, um, Judge Davies, he is evil. He is wrong. He is corrupt. He is the opposition. You um, have someone like Kovacs, she is honest, trustworthy, authoritarian. Then you've got Jack, who's in the middle, and he smudges everything. So even if you've got someone like Dredd, who will just come in, shoot the villain, leave, that would seem like an obvious, open, simple act. But Jack will manipulate the situation to make even Dredd killing an actual villain seem like something morally dubious, morally strange, morally unpredictable. So essentially, the, I think the, the, the key thing with the series is that it's presenting you these hyper-exaggerated characters in this strange world as um, stark magnetic opposites to each other. But by having Jack as the main character, it's, it blurs all the lines, it smudges everything together, and it creates a series which is um, really just operating as this properly noir, untrustworthy um, storyline. Uh, this un- untrustworthy narrative where nobody is quite operating the same way you'd expect them to. Right. It's, it's interesting that, that in the um, last sort of 15 years or so, we've, we've seen, an, uh, uh, not an explosion, but a, a great many um, series that are, are set it that are dreadverse that are set in dreads world they're exploring different aspects you know what the simple detective low life is the obvious comparator um uh, and uh, we'll talk about how they came together for for trifecta uh, in a bit um but then you've also got other series like dan abnett's uh, and phil winslade's lawless mm. um do, do you think this is uh, a symptom uh, of writers wanting to flex their muscles in this world in a different way you know still still engage with this world but not through the prism of something as monosyllabic as as one note-ish as dread yeah i think it's writers wanting to have more control over their endings um someone like Cy Spurrier as a writer he tends to always build towards an ending which makes sense which is great but it's not always what you actually get to do in the world of comics and if you are writing a story with judge dread 
you can't end the story with Dredd being appointed head judge or um, killing everyone or making a heroic sacrifice and dying. Dredd has to continue on because it's not your story to conclude. But if you can find another character and you can bring them into the same world, you can touch on Dredd and all he stands for and all, all, all the ideas of, of that series, but you can then twist it off into whatever you want to, to make it. So you can have something like is a noir story, like The Simple Detective, or you can have something like Lawless, which is a much more, uh, it feels much more open as a series um, and um, a little bit more, a little bit more relaxed in a sense, I think, which is a strange way to describe um, describe the series, but it feels like it's got that much more of a much more considered in a sense. Um, and with all these different stories, what you're really giving the reader is an alternative perspective to the main um, flagship. It's it's like having I'm going to go to the X Men. X Men is what I go to. Uh, it's it's like with the X Men and Marvel. So um, you've got the main X Men and whatever they do what they like. Everybody knows the most interesting story is the one of the, the ragtag group of random characters that no one really remembers. If you've got a book which is like Wolverine, Storm, Colossus, great, whatever. If you've got a book that's like here's Maggot and Pyro and Pixie and Dazzler that's when you're going to go, oh, great. I don't know what these ones are going to do. I don't know what's going to happen to them. I don't know where this story's going to go. Um, with something like Simpson Detective, Cy Spurrier at any point might kill Jack Points. He could do anything to Jack Point, really, and you don't know what's going to, what's going to come next. Um, with something like Low Life, you don't really know what's happening with Dirty Frank. Dirty Frank? You don't really know what's happening to him until it starts unraveling. And that could be, there could have been 10 different explanations for, for, for him. And that's the one they went with. And that's the one that makes the most sense at the time. You can't really do that with an established flagship property like Dread. What you can do is you can find a way to undermine it or subvert it or um, essentially play as a different perspective. Um, and I think that's what this incentive is all about, really. It's about taking the, the, the kind of scary authoritarian world of Judge Dredd and saying, yeah, but what if there was a really bad part of that? And taking the reader right down into not only the worst place in the world, but finding the worst block in the worst place in the world. And that's something that's really interesting. And it's something that I really enjoyed seeing from two thousand AD over the years, you're seeing other writers come in and saying, right, I'm gonna fence off this area and I'm gonna put these sort of characters in. I'm gonna try this sort of style and I'm gonna see how it all works because Dread is so well known and established. We know what to expect from all that. You don't have to paint everything um, in a detailed brush. You can just give us a broad strokes and then say, right, this is what my weird characters are gonna do in this world. And I think that's been a really I think that's kind of invigorated Mega City One, in a sense, if it was all Judge Dread all the time, it would one be quite depressing, <laughs> um, but at the same time, um, it would also feel like it's it's quite difficult to keep a decades-long satire on point. Giving you these other little series that step in and touch on it and add to it and give you other things to work with, I think has helped keep everything feel fresh and alive. If the world just kept to be the same shape all the time, you wouldn't go anywhere. But as it can keep expanding and expanding, it gives you so much more to play with and so many little strange twists that you can put into something. You can meet strange characters against each other. You can, you can do anything, really. And that's, I think, what's key about these sorts of stories is it just presents so much more opportunity and gives everything more space to play with. It's been noted uh, elsewhere that um, uh, through the 80s and 90s, if ever there was a, a, a new series that was set in Dread's world um, or a new character, 
it tended just to be another version of dread. So you look at something like uh, uh, Calhab Justice, you know, for, for all of his, his swearing and his drinking and everything, uh, the main character in that is essentially just a different version of Judge Dredd. And the same with an awful lot of others. But you're right, there is this kind of tonal change uh, as, as we came into the, 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 the 2000s where um, writers realised, or, or, or new writers came along who knew that... Um, that wasn't the only story to tell. It was, you know, you, you could tell other stories in in this world that wasn't just the big man with the stick or the gun. Um, and what has been for me key to this is that um, these have been separate to Dread. You know, Dread has made cameos in both Low Life and The Simping Detective, but then slowly but surely they have leached into his world, and we ended up with trifecta which was the um uh, the surprise crossover between simple detective low life uh, and dread um and so to a certain extent that chaos has come to dread's door these agents of chaos have literally as dread does in in trifecta kick the door down and come charging in and to a certain extent based on what what has later happened with things like um uh, Rob Williams's uh, Titan series uh, have caused real problems for Dread's world. So it's interesting that, that, that you know the chaos has, has established itself elsewhere and then has kind of come in and and uh, infected his his more ordered world. And it's it's always fun to see something like that. It's always fun to see Dread have to deal with someone who should really just be an irritant and treat them as an equal. So someone like Jack Point should really just be doing his own strange thing in his own strange corner. And he can play with dread because the dread you see in The Simple Detective isn't a dread who's going to make a major character-changing decision. He's just going to appear, do his dread thing, and leave, which is essentially what Jack says to him at several points. Um, but in Trifecta, what you've got was Jack and Dirty Frank being so... Uh, important and, and winding up the world so so cleverly that Dread had to come to them to deal with them. And it's fun to see someone like Dread made fun of in a comic series like The Insective. It's another thing to see him stoop to their level in his own series, which is what you get throughout that storyline is he is having to acknowledge the existence of both Jack and, and Frank as um, essentially people who are technically his equal and work alongside him in the judge department. And that's a really entertaining thing to get to see the authorities have to deal with people who are uh, not on their level in a sense. I just want to talk a little bit more about the artwork because um, Fraser Irving has, has, has two major phases to his career one fairly short and, and one that is ongoing and you know he came to 2000 AD as an artist who dealt in physical media you know he, he painted with a, a well, he drew with a brush and a, a, a pen and everything and then he would move on to full computer coloring and and you know an incredible palette and really interesting work this is the kind of interstitial phase where he is still working in black and white in a, in a monochrome world but it is computer, uh, it's, you know, it's done on a computer. I was about to say computer generated. Not, um, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's done on a computer. Um, what do you think uh, it is about Irving's artwork on this that really clicks with um, Spurrier's uh, work? Because they, they collaborated on Gutsville uh, for Image, uh, but that was in colour. There's, there's, there's something about the series that where, where they really work together well. Why do you think that is? Preserving is so different to what you might expect from 2000 AD when you pick up any prog. You know that every strip is going to look different. It's going to be stylized in some way. Um, but Fraser Irving's artwork is just completely unexpected, I think. Um, the way he draws characters and the way he approaches telling the story sequentially is something I don't think many other people would 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 try. Um, 
it's interesting actually, I mentioned Seven Soldiers, and of course he drew one of those um, miniseries, um, which was the Clarion series, which was done in a more puritanical style uh, to match the character. And so that had those more, more black and white pages, or the, the color was drained out, at least at the start and the end when they're set in Clarion's world. When you look at the work that he's doing here, um, I think it's interesting that he's working there in, in black and white because there's such a sense of color, uh, a such sense of light and color in his work. You see the characters and um, there's only occasions where he draws in splashes of color, uh, when people are on drug trips or when you see um, some of the, um, the monsters, the reptiles who show up towards the end, or when you see blood. And by keeping all the color drained out, you get that feeling that this is within the 2018 universe, but you're getting something that feels more contemporary and um, futuristic at the same time. So you get the characters who act like modern day characters would, but you're also getting them set in a futuristic landscape with futuristic clothing and futuristic props around them, like the, the, the weapons that Jack plays with or the, um, the, the clothes that Galen wears or um, even the, the cosplay party, you can see little bits of um, stuff in the background all the time, which is just bonkers. Um, Fraser Irving will warp everything in the background um, and he will make the foreground seem rigid and um, sensible. When you see Judge Davies, he barely moves, his face is stern, he, um, he doesn't express anything. But then in comparison, half the time, Jack will be in the background of the scene and he'll be waving his arms around, he'll be flapping his legs about, he'll be making these strange faces. And I think what works is the way that Fraser Irving as an artist will give you little pockets of energy and pockets of stillness, which is essentially how Sysburia writes. So when Sysburia writes, you will get this um, straightforward narration but what he take, does then is he then puts extra words in he takes out the full stops he puts in more exclamation marks or he, he changes the, the grammar and the function of what the sentence is so it reads as a very start stop running along very quick energy very slow energy it's all over the place and Irving is an artist who can actually keep up with that because he can he can go full tilt into complete weirdness and then he can immediately pull straight back into something that feels logical, rational, cold, careful, calculated. And I think that's perhaps where the um, collaboration works best is, is on the stories like um, Nobody Know How, where you keep returning to that solemn image of a dead body, which is something, obviously, it's, it's horrible. You don't want to have a dead body in your bed. Um, and Every time it's presented, it's presented just a still point of view, uh, point of fact image. It's just there, seen from above, there's the dead body. And yet, because of the, the way it's presented elsewhere, all the, the clowning that's going on and the, the rushing around, the dashing about the apartment, every single time he returns to that still scene, which shows you a crime scene, a murder scene, there's something comic about it. And... I think that is perhaps the best summation of both of their creative careers is that one of the selfiest funny scenes in their story is the scene which is simply a dead body lying on a bed. I think that's probably the legacy that both Sysbury and Fraser Irving would want to leave on the world. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, I, I think on that point, it's, it's the ideal moment to, uh, to bring things to a, a, an end. Uh, thank you so much for chatting away about that. It's fantastic. I, I hadn't read um, Timber Detective uh, for absolutely ages, so it was a pleasure to, to, to rediscover. Um, if people need to find you uh, online to give uh, their own opinions about uh, uh, Timber Detective, where can they find you? Uh, they can find me on Twitter. I am Steve W. Morris. Um, or they can find me uh, on Shelf Dust, where most days of the week we're posting something different. So that's www.shelfdust.com. Um, yeah, that's basically the two places you should find me. 
Well, a huge thank you to Steve for that absolutely fascinating chat about The Simping Detective. Uh, if you've got a collection that you would like us to focus on in the future for a deep dive, drop us a line at thrillcast at 2000ad.com and we'll see what we can do. Uh, we're going to be back in a few days' time with more from the Galaxy's Greatest Podcast, more feature interviews, more deep dives, more talking to uh, creators. Um, please do let us know what you think about the podcast. If there's stuff you'd like us to feature, if there's stuff you don't like hearing about, uh, regardless, then, uh, yeah, please let us know. Um, until next time, Earthlets, we hope you stay safe. We hope you stay well and look after one another. Um, enjoy the long weekend, if you can. And Splendid Earthwig. Power levels dangerously high. Alert, alert. Read 2000 AD every week. Ask your comic book store or news agent now. Subscribe to the galaxy's greatest comic at 2000adonline.com.